Um, welcome to this C4 ECRAF uh, webinar on wildfires in tropical dry ecosystems, integrated fire management, emission abatements, and NDCs. My name is Rosa Maria Roman Cuesta. I am a C4 associate and a research um, associate also at uh, Wageningen University. Um, I would like to thank, first of all, our donor, USAID, uh, for allowing us to do the research that is going to be presented today and supporting our research for the last three years. And I would also like to extend a warm welcome to everyone in this webinar and a particular thanks to our panelists, particularly those that are in Australia, which is past midnight and are here attending it. So thanks warmly. Um, also, um, Mozambique, that is rather late for you as well. So without further ado, let's start with this uh, webinar on wildfires in tropical dry ecosystems, emissions abatements, and NDCs. Uh, the background of this webinar uh, and our gratitude goes to USAID uh, for having supported uh, C4 ECRAF in running research that contained fire components in it for the last three years. So um, three of these uh, projects are listed here. One uh, related to forest landscape restoration and overcoming key barriers for effective implementation. In the frame of that research, we were focusing on how fire acted as a permanent risk in Latin America um, and how that permanent risk was affecting the areas available for restoration and the final mitigation potential in an S scenario where um, an assisted natural regeneration could have brought sequestration power. Um, other two projects that have been running for the last two years on fire are also listed here, and one of them uh, tried to un investigate where are the hotspots of fire activity in the tropics, and we will see right now how we define hotspots. We will be discussing uh, about this project today and the following project. And the idea was to be able to understand where these hotspots in the tropics are and try to foresee some action. And that's where it comes, the last project, which basically tries to integrate some type of fire management as a mainstreaming fire management into landscape decisions and um, trying to reduce uh, fire emissions so that they could in be incorporated in NDCs and within countries' uh, national mitigation commitments. You will see during the chat today that uh, fire management and integrated fire management was by no means thought for mitigating emissions, so it was a collateral benefit. Uh, but in this webinar in particular, we will be focusing on the use of uh, integrated fire management and specific activities within it for uh, natural climate solutions, for their use as a way to promote mitigation um, uh, for reducing fire emissions. We will also see that this type of activities also promote adaptation. Uh, they reduce, they buffer ecosystems against uh, very severe fire years. We will see that. Uh, and they also promote carbon sequestration on soils and uh, carbon sequestration on those fragments on the landscape that are being uh, less affected by fire. So fire management in this, in this webinar uh, will be particularly focusing on climate mitigation, but certainly there are many other co-benefits, adaptation, um, biodiversity, water control, uh, etc. Okay. Um, let's start a bit with the facts. So the fact is um, that fire currently is almost everywhere present in the planet. And in this figure, you can see the distribution of monthly fires from 2000 to 2009 using satellite data collected by uh, the MODIS satellite. So the question here is, yes, there is fire almost everywhere, but are these fires normal? or are these fires desirable? Or what can we do or where should we act? So we can see um, in different colors the seasonality of these fires. Um, and what is important as, as a starting point of this webinar is that from those ecosystems that there is fire, some of them are fire adapted, they have co-evolved with fire. Fire is part of the ecosystem stability and is required. And in some ecosystems like humid, tropical ecosystems, cloud mountain forests, uh, tropical rainforests, Mata Atlantica, 
some of these forested, very humid ecosystems have not co-evolved with fire. Fire is not part of their dynamics and therefore their ecosystem stability it's uh, eroded by the presence and increased presence of fire that we are seeing in the last decades. So this, this should be the starting warning point that we are going to talk about prescribed fire, uh, but we're going to focus that into ecosystems that are fire adapted. Um, in the last decades and starting actually very strongly mediatic pressure from fires around the world starting in 2017, uh, and also last year, 2019, was a very fire um, severe year that was also heavily distributed by, by all the news on, on different parts of the world. So here we have uh, the 2 million hectares that were burning in Australian fires. We also had the Indonesian fires in 2019 with the haze health problems that affected the neighboring countries. Um, we also had boreal fires uh, in Alaska, Canada. The year before, we had had fire emergencies in British Columbia in 2018. Um, and also, naturally, we had a very mediatic, uh, high, highly biased um, preference for tropical rainforest fires that we have seen in the media also in the last year. If you look at the media this year, some of these ecosystems are again on fire. We have uh, emergencies in the boreal ecosystems. We also have emergencies again in Brazil. And for the first time, we are seeing finally um, not in, in the fire not only being uh, promoted in the media as uh, the rainforest fires, but also fires that are um, affecting dry ecosystems. So. The problem or the question to be answered about uh, these fires is, are these fires normal? And this is also a call to the uh, journalists that might be part of this webinar. Um, it is important to understand that the presence of fire in certain ecosystems is acceptable at certain thresholds and certain, certain seasonalities with uh, certain interval uh, periods. While in other ecosystems, the presence of fire is absolutely problematic for the reasons that we mentioned before, that these ecosystems are not adapted to the presence of fire and therefore are not resilient to the presence of fire. And then to answer the question of whether these fires are normal, um, we are going to look at these triangles of fire um, ignition and fire spread uh, that lead us to the key answer to this question. The normality of fire depends on the fire regimes, the ecosystems that are affected. Um, and the fire regimes um, is basically a, a, a terminology that englobes a series of variables uh, that define how these ecosystems interact with fire. So in a Mediterranean ecosystem, we would have a fire regime where higher, where frequency um, is relatively high once every 10 years. Um, or, or once every 20 years, depending if it's grassland or shrubland or forest-led uh, fires. The intensity, depending on the frequency of this fire, should be relatively low because the fuels accumulated a long time are lower. And then the severity of these fires have to do with the uh, ecosystem resilience and with the intensity of these fires. So in an ecosystem like the Mediterranean, the severity of these fires is punctually important, but then it recovers a long time. The different situation would be with the fire regime in a tropical rainforest or a cloud mountain forest where the frequency of fire should be once every 100 years or even more every once every 250 years and not the, the frequency that we are seeing right now in certain parts of the tropical rainforest of the Amazon. We see fire once every 15 uh, or every 10 years recurrent on the same site with the specificity that tropical rainforests have on, on feedback of fire. Uh, also, the intensity of these fires is relatively high in, the, in these tropical rainforests when the years have severe drought. Uh, and, the, and the severity of these fires end up being rather high in tropical rainforests because um, there is these ecosystems, as we said before, not adapted. So what is important to, to look at this graph is that there are fire acts at different scales. It acts on an spatial scale. We can see that on the uh, y axis and on a temporal scale. And we can see that on the x uh, axis. And there are at least two variables that are also important and are influencing fire regimes, which would be 
the uh, fire risk, which relates to the ignitions uh, of fire, and then the fire spread, which is related to or oh, defined as, as fire danger. So once the fire uh, has started, how easily that fire spreads is, is, um, is defined as fire danger. The fire ignition depends on ignition sources and depends on fuels, and these both are heavily impacted by humans. So fuels, they need to be flammable, so the weather conditions do play a role, but humans play a role on, on ignitions. You can have heavily um, um, drought-affected ecosystems that will not burn if the ignitions are not there, and this is something that is currently also happening. So. Um, the inflammability conditions of some of these ecosystems has already been high in the past, but what we have now is an increased amount of ignition sources. Then the second triangle describes how fire spreads, and this is heavily conditioned by weather. If you look at the news, the 30-30-30 rule is always applied. If you have a fire that has already started the ignition and you have winds that are above 30 kilometers per hour, uh, humidity is below 30% and temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius, you are going to have a very hard to attack uh, fire. And if this is prolonged a long time, then you're going to have a very severe fire season. If you change the ignitions and if you change the, uh, the fire spread, then you are going to change your fire regimes. Okay? The weather conditions are very important for fire spread but also the configuration of the landscape, the way that fuels connect on the landscape are also very important. So even though weather is changing and is playing a role, humans are playing a bigger role in many of these landscapes. So when we want to answer the questions of are these fires normal, what we want to understand is whether these fire regimes are changing from what they used to be before in previous decades. Okay. Um, our second question then understood this concept of what is normal and what is not normal. Our project tried to understand and tried to act upon those hotspots in the tropics that saw uh, an increased um, uh, role as, as fire hotspots. And we define fire hotspots in three different ways. We want to know um, the hotspots are those that have higher fire densities. So per unit of area, they have more fire. And when you look at this variable, obviously Africa is the fire continent. And the continent at the global scale, the fire continent is Africa. Africa is burning all the time. Um, the thing is that these ecosystems, in most of these ecosystems are fire adapted. Um, the savannas, miombos ecosystems have co-evolved with fire. But as we will see right now, the problem is not, not that they are necessarily adapted, but that we are seeing a change in the burn area trends. And this is actually our second definition of fire hotspot. So we want to know which of these um, areas that are burning in the tropics are actually suffering for changes in the fire trends. They're having more burn areas. And this will, at the end, change the fire regimes and they will affect ecosystem stability. They will affect carbon balances. It will affect biodiversity levels. It will affect human health. Um, and, and, and water balances as well. And um, to answer these two questions, this graph that was produced, this picture produced by Andela et al. in 2017, uh, on the lower panel, you can see how the burn areas have been changing from 1997 to 2015. And in blue, you can see the areas where the, the, the fire has been, the fire, um, the burn area has been reduced. And on a planetary level, we have seen a decrease of burn areas from 1997 to 2016, uh, 15. But on red, we see the areas that require our attention because those are the areas that are currently seen or have been seen an increase of these burn areas. If we look closely at them, what we can see is that these areas correspond to dry forests and dry ecosystems. We see Cerrado in Brazil, we see the Eastern and Western Miombos in Africa, and we see the Indochina uh, dry forests. So even though the media has biased and popularized fires in tropical humid rainforests, one of the starting points for our discussion are going to be the areas where we are seeing strong changes in burn areas that are dry ecosystems, not humid ecosystems. 
you can see in blue the areas with decreased burn areas and in red the areas with increased uh, burn areas and what is important of this one is that the blue ones frequently are affecting uh, grasslands and not forest cover ecosystems uh, so the savannas of this world of the three continents are seeing less fire but then in red we see areas where the fraction of forest cover is high or it, at least it's not grassland led fire so we do have a component of, of forest in these ecosystems that are seeing these increases we repeated the graph by Andela, trying to eliminate the starting from from 1997 and 98, which, which was a very strong El Nino year. And we wanted to see if that might have changed the trends. And we started with 2001 and moved until 2016. We saw the same trends. The ecosystems that are right now being more affected by increasing trends of fire and burn areas are dry ecosystems in the three, in the three continents, Chaco, uh, Chiquitania, Cerrado, Miombo, Eastern and Western, and then, as we said before, Indochina dry forest. And this is the reason why this webinar is going to focus on these ecosystems. Our third definition of fire hotspot was identifying future hotspots of fire activity. And to do that, we basically use the correlation between burn area and precipitation. We also use temperature, but temperature was not so clear for 2000 to 2019. And then we apply this correlation to the future weather conditions as defined by the CMIP5. And what we can see that, and then we did that for three periods, but right now I'm only showing you then these uh, projected areas of future fire risk, um, which would be uh, for the period of 2021 and 2045. And what we see again, indicated by the arrows again, are the dry ecosystems that ones that are going to be, um, that are projected to be suffering from more intense um, burn areas in the future. We wanted to know which part of this activity was climate related and which part of this activity was human related, even though, as I said before, these two are very much intertwined. So if you have very flammable ecosystems because of severe drought conditions, and you don't have an ignition source, that ecosystem will not burn. So, and if you have mediumly affected ecosystems that heavily ignition source, that ecosystem and that landscape will be heavily affected by fire. So, but it's important then to understand at least what is happening with this trend on, on climate for these areas. And what we see on the lower panel, you see the um, Palmer drought um, severity index uh, for 82 to 2016. So this is a trend. And on the upper one, you have also a trend of maximum temperature from the same period. And you can see the aridity is increasing on ecosystems that uh, in, in Latin America is increasing almost everywhere, but it is affecting these areas that have these dry ecosystems. And in Africa, it is, it's affecting the Eastern Miombo sites. And in Australia, it's affecting part of these Eastern sites that were so fire um, affected last year. Um, we validated these uh, climate trends of higher aridity and increased um, temperature for these uh, uh, dry ecosystems using this very nice research that Jolie et al. did in 2015, where they were looking basically at how the burnable areas of the entire planet had been increasing due to uh, climate-induced um, conditions that, uh, that enhance uh, the fire dangers to be high. So basically in these two panels in red, you see the areas where uh, climate induced um, uh, increases in global wildfire have been observed for the period 1997, 79 to 2013. And again, they are again all the time um, focusing or highlighting uh, some of the areas that we have been identified where currently there is increased burn areas in the tropics. So dry ecosystems um, are very uh, strongly impacted. And you can see here the area of El Chaco, you can see the Cerrado, um, you can see then again Miombos and the Indochina and dry forests. And what is important is that even though there has been uh, a lot of media discussion about rainforests in the last two years, the dry ecosystems have barely reached the media. So we have a bit of a Cinderella syndrome where uh, the charismatic rainforest, the humid rainforest, for, for good reasons, right? And also these are the non-adapted 
uh, fire ecosystems are rich in the media, but we are not highlighting enough the danger that we are seeing in how these forested and open woodland ecosystems that have forest covered are severely being affected by climate, by aridity, by fire, and part of this fire is driven by the expansion of agro-commodities. This is very clearly uh, stated in the case of El Cerrado. The moratorium for soya in the Amazonian, in the wet Amazonian, extra, ex, basically brought the um, deforestation into Cerrado, and a lot of the fires that we are seeing now are for expansion of our commodities. Okay, so we do have both scenarios that are bad. Climate is bad, and human ignitions are bad. These are a few pictures of what you will be seeing later on this webinar. How, how does a Serrata look and how does a Niombo look? I know colleagues that will be giving these presentations are probably horrified because Serrato has so many different soup ecosystems and Niombo has so many different soup ecosystems that this is not very representative. But at least you can see how uh, there is a combination of forested fragments with grasslands and, and different gradients of fully forest cover from more, much more um, grassland um, mosaics. Um, therefore, as a continuation of our research, what we did was then to select um, countries that were holding these dry ecosystems, as you can see here, for uh, Latin America, we focus on Cerrado, Chaco, Chiquitania, so Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, and Paraguay, and then for Africa, we were focusing on Western, Eastern, Niombo, Angola, Zambia, Botswana, Mozambique, and then for Indochina's dry forests, we focus on Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Thailand. And with these countries, what we did was to assess the evolution of greenhouse gas emissions using the Global Fire Emission Database. And we separated those emissions by ecosystem types. So here you have the case of Cerrado, and you have here deforestation and degradation fires focusing only on CO2. We should also we also have these graphs for non-CO2. Remember that in areas where uh, there are no woody vegetation, only non-CO2 uh, gases should be accounted because grassland recovers uh, and regenerates on the next um, on the next year, and therefore there is an assumption of carbon neutrality for CO2 for non-woody vegetation. But what I want to show you is that even though of the, there was a strong media um, outrage for the fire in the Amazon, which was uh, rightly so, but it was again biased uh, in the sense that compared to the um, long term distribution of, of fires and emissions in, in Brazil, it, it was a moderate peak. Um, also here you see the distribution of fires uh, on the red and blue are Cerrado fires. Unfortunately, these are not area ratioed emissions and because Cerrados is smaller than the Amazon then you have lower um, emissions because they are absolute emissions but if we ratio this uh, this this graph would change and on the lower part you have the Pantanal the Pantanal has been in the news this year because it was 33 percent of this very valuable endemic ecosystem has been severely burned part of it for conditions of climate, part of it also promoted fires to expand livestock, to expand uh, agro-commodities. Um, so what we also wanted to do here is to start analyzing fire emissions for these ecosystems and try to start understanding the baselines of how fire has evolved in the last, in the last year, trying to see how this could contribute to a potential analysis of mitigation um, targets and emission abatement for these countries for a specific ecosystems. Another thing that we did was to visualize where these fires had happened for each year, starting 2000 to 2019. I am only showing you 2019, where the anomalous fires had happened. So what I'm showing you here is for each of the quarters, so December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, where the standardized anomalies of fire occurred, which represent the areas that have fires that are not normal, that are above the means and above the standard variability of, of, of those pixels. These are pixel-based anomalous fires. And this gives a lot of information when we are trying to manage fire at the landscape. So we are not treating every area as if it was all the same fire. We see that there are certain regions in Brazil that were burning like Roraima at the beginning of the year. Also seasonalities are different. On, on the June, July, August 
panel, you can see the fires on the Trans-Amazonian Highway. And then you can see the very severe Cerrado fires of 2019 that barely made it to the news, okay? So this also, we have this for all the countries, for all the seasons, for all the quarters, for all the years, which uh, allows us also to start thinking of where and in which seasons and whether there are out of season fires that need to be managed, uh, we could start working and thinking of integrated fire management. Very briefly, I'm only going to show this one. Um, even though 2019 ended up being a very mediatic fire year for different fires happening in different countries, from a drought perspective, it was not a very drought year in Brazil. Uh, it was very drought in Australia, but not it was not particularly dry particularly in, in Brazil, particularly on the rainforests and the moist ecosystem. So in this graph, you see the anomalies, so the variability of uh, precipitation in blue and maximum temperature in orange from 2001 to 2019 as a an standardized anomaly. So compared to this period, which are the ones that pick more and which pick less? So for the dry ecosystems, which is the upper panel, yes, indeed, it was a drought. It was a dry year. And for both um, the dry ecosystems on the upper panel and the moist ecosystem on the lower panel, it was a very hot year. And this is something that also is starting to raise our interest. There is a hypothesis that future fire activity is going to be driven by temperature, not by precipitation. And um, we start seeing some hints of temperature starting to have a, a bigger role in areas where ecosystems are already degraded and where ignition sources are not limited. So not particularly dry for the moist ecosystems in 2019, in the June, July, August, neither in September, October, November. It was particularly dry for, um, for the dry ecosystems for Cerrado. Uh, and it was very hot year in, in all um, these ecosystems analyzed. After having this picture, then we can start thinking of which type of fire management activities we could start applying into these landscapes and the landscape configuration so that we could uh, promote mitigation action. And I'm presenting very briefly these Griscom's um, figures where fire management is mentioned uh, to our understanding, a big conservative value. So um, there are 250 teragrams of CO2 equivalent per year that have been identified as potential mitigation uh, for, for the entire planet. Uh, and we will see with our uh, Australian speaker that um, in their research, just for savanna mitigation and emission abatement, uh, those values were already 89. So this, this fire management require, requires more research. Um, these are my a few of my last slides, there are three more, but basically in order to promote emission abatement with fire and with fire management, the first thing that we need to do is to estimate these emissions, the fire emissions every year, so that we can then look at the evolution, we can define the baseline, and then we can apply activities that allow to convert the resulting decrease of emissions after the application of the activity. And to do that, even this, this um, equation that I'm showing here is based on the IPCC refinement of the 2006 Apollo guidelines, but the structure of this equation is the same for any carbon market. So in order to estimate emissions, you need to understand how much area has burned, how much fuel you had, and how much of that fuel was flammable through the uh, emission factors. In these speakers coming later on, we will be looking at all these variables. What I would like to say here is that all these variables uh, are available um, in standard tables uh, for reporting in tier one, with the exception of area, but area is available also in international fire uh, data sets. Even emissions are available if you don't want to calculate that. So for us, the, the rationale behind countries not including fire emission abatements and mitigation targets into their NDCs is not technical. This is not more complicated than what they have already done in other uh, AFOLU emissions in their national communications. It's not more complicated, but um, we believe that there is more a bit of a governance issue associated to this and um, the, the implementation of fire activities that gets difficult. It's not, not necessarily the technical part of estimating this because as I said before, emissions are already available in the global fire emission database if countries want to start comparing trends, right? Um, and they also can use this tier one 
uh, standard values uh, for fuels and for uh, emission factors and only applying areas of their countries. And these are examples of how these data are available on the um, standard values of tier one. Once we have estimated the emissions, the next step would be definitely to implement fire management activities that would allow to reduce emissions from fires. And to reduce emissions from fires, we would have to reduce the area burned, the fuel loads, or to affect the fuel flammability, so the um, emission factors. Um, integrated fire management will be nicely discussed by our next speaker, uh, Anya. But basically, you can affect these three variables from any of the three processes of any fire management, prevention, uh, suppression, or restoration. Each of these phases are different uh, cost benefits and are more useful than the others. But in this webinar, we're going to focus on prescribed burning as a fire management activity within fire prevention that will affect area burns, fuel loads, and fuel flammability. It is not the only one, right? That's something that is also very important. But because of the expertise that we have today, we will focus on prescribed burning. You could also have fire banning, which is also something that has been done in many countries and that Brazil also applied when the situation of fire, both in the Amazon, was out of control. And actually, the banning affected the Amazon, but it didn't affect the Cerrado, which was under far more fire than normal. Um, again, as a, as a, syn a Cinderella syndrome for, for these dry forests, uh, policies are not necessarily applied because the international pressure is not the same on dry forests. And that's something that I hope to raise from this webinar. Please, if there is any journalist in this webinar, raise the attention of dry ecosystems. Um, final two slides. The intention of, in of prescribed burning as a way to abate emissions, basically focusing on shifting the emissions from the dry, from the, um, the late dry season into the early dry season. We will see that in many examples in the case of El Cerrado and in case of, of Australia. But the idea is not necessarily to reduce the number of fires, but the idea is to move it out of season so that the fuels in that time are less flammable and therefore you reduce your burn areas, you also reduce your emission factors, which will also be discussed for Botswana, and at the end you have less emissions as a result. Another important activity of, of fire management and prescribed burning is to buffer fires from uh, very severe years. We have this fragmentation process going on in the landscape that is promoted by this prescribed burning that then um, reduces the risk of catastrophic fire. And these are the pathways that countries can incorporate their emission abatements uh, through carbon offsets in different markets. The first two correspond to the UNFCCC and the other two responds to carbon markets. So uh, under NDCs, we need to uh, uh, wait for the Article 6 to have better understanding how carbon is going to be traded among countries. But the idea is, and the encouragement is, those of you who have interest in start incorporating fire as part of your mitigation and adaptation targets, please start working on creating um, under your national greenhouse gas inventories for the Apollo sector, um, uh, the, the emissions that are CO2, uh, and the emissions that are non-CO2 coming from fire. So start creating separated lines of reporting for fire. That would allow you to start moving towards mitigation targeted and increasing uh, compromise in, in, in the future NDCs uh, resubmissions. The FREL is another opportunity for having fire incorporated into forest mitigation uh, reductions. The problem with many FRELs is that all forest types are mixed together and all degradation sources are mixed together. So it makes it rather difficult to separate fire from the frail and then uh, and have a significant reduction of the overall degradation with, with that. But that could also be an act and line of action, focusing on reducing degradation fires within the frail frameworks. Right now, many countries are reporting deforestation fires, but they are not reporting degradation fires. Frails are the opportunity to focus on that. And then we have examples of a voluntary carbon market uh, as other ways of, of uh, putting uh, these carbon offsets into, uh, into these markets with the standards that are having similar variables as the ones that we were showing. Uh, and there are two available methodologies, the Eastern Nyombo created by Tanzania by reducing fire and fire degradation, but also 
improving the sequestration of soil carbon in grasslands. As I said before, the mitigation component can come by reducing the emissions, but also by incrementing sequestration on soils and on above ground biomass. And then we have the very interesting case example of Australia with their national regulated carbon markets that will show us how they have sold or uh, they are selling their abatement emissions carbon offsets through certain standards but they are selling it within their in their regulated carbon markets so this is the opening of the webinar so that you understand a bit more why dry dry ecosystems why mitigation targets and why prescribed burning and i'm going to open the floor now to anya hoffman Anya Hoffman is an integrated fire management specialist. She has worked over 20 years as a consultant for various international development cooperation organizations on three different continents. She has gained in-depth knowledge and extensive experience on integrated fire management and its elements, as well as in the planning and implementing EFM strategies and policies for the conservation and management of natural resources. As a member of the Science Forum Global Observation of Forest and Land Cover Dynamics, she connects scientists, practitioners, and policymakers in the area of satellite fire monitoring worldwide. Welcome, Anya. The floor is yours. Thank you, Rosa, and uh, thank you, colleagues, for letting me join in into this session. And uh, thank you for the audience. And I can see we have already a hundred. 37 participants in this audience and I quickly looked through the names and I can see names uh, from Brazil, I can see names from Tanzania, from people I do know and um, just that I cannot greet them all personally but I would like to greet <laughs> them via this seminar in Tanzania, in Brazil and in other countries. Um, let me share my video and my screen. Hello, here I am. This is how I look like nowadays um, in my home office. And now I share the screen. Wait a second. Here we are. Let's see whether this is going to work. So, which one are you seeing now? Uh, we're not yet. No, no, try again, Anya. Okay. Okay, share the screen. Let me take your time. Um, in yeah. the meantime, to all the participants, there, there is a recording of this audio, uh, sorry, of this webinar, and the presentations and the uh, recorded audio will be uh, uh, edited and then the, it will be posted online on the same web page where the registration. Um, site was and I will put that on the on the chat so that everyone has it also the way we are going to organize questions is we will have a space at the very end and then we will also have a bit of a space after each chat so that you can ask uh, urgent questions okay still yeah, this is the problem of having two screens to share <laughs> take take your time no worries Anya take your time yeah. Okay. So uh, now, 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 now. Excellent. Okay. And you see the big screen, now the one slide. Okay. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, integrated fire management and the elements of integrated fire management. As Rosa was saying, the entire webinar is focusing more on the fire emission abatement side of integrated fire management. But I would like to set the scene of what is integrated fire management all about? What does it mean? Because there is no international agreed definition. Of course, there are some uh, documentations like the FAO integrated fire management um, standard, which is uh, quite old by now. It hasn't been updated. And in the literature and uh, published uh, papers, you find various definitions of uh, what is integrated fire management all about. And I would like to share, um, this is not my 
personal definition, but what I've kind of learned over the, the years, what, what are the elements of integrated fire management and where does prescribed burning or controlled burning fit in this cycle of integrated fire management. So Rosa has set um, the scene already of the global role of fires. Um, I just uh, repeat it again. The global role of fire is quite big. In the meantime, when I started to give this kind of presentations a couple of years ago, the annual area burned globally was 360 million hectares of vegetation. I recently updated, looked at the literature, um, uh, what is the more or less agreed uh, uh, area burned globally, and it has, uh, it has increased to 40, 430 million hectares of vegetation by now. As Rosa was saying, fire, the fire continent is Africa with about 200 million hectares burning annually which amounts to 40% of the biomass worldwide. Um, yes, fire is an important ecological driver in fire depending ecosystems in uh, dry forest ecosystems such as the Cerrado or the, the Miombo woodlands or the Indochina China dry forest such as Myanmar. But it is a negative disturbance in fire sensitive countries in fire sensitive ecosystems such as the tropical rainforest of the Amazon region or the Indonesian tropical rainforests. I've been living and working in both types of ecosystems over many years. So in both ecosystems fire is a tool, it is a tool in forest management and it is a tool in land uh, is a land management tool. And worldwide, we do see a paradigm shift from the strict fire suppression or the zero burning uh, policy to more integrated fire management. But what does, what does it mean, more integrated fire management? So often fire management is equalized with fire management is fire suppression. So, but this is not the case. It is much more complicated, um, the elements and the implementation of activities of integrated fire management. I want to come back a little bit on uh, the negative impacts of fires. And of course, we do uh, hear, hear about them quite a lot and I'm pretty sure we all know it. So we do have, of course, the problem of smoke and haze emissions, but we do also have a problem to due to smoke and haze on uh, transport and tourism. These are all pictures of um, the fire seasons in Indonesia. Of course, health impacts are negative impacts done of the economic impact on the forestry and agriculture sector. And last but not least, the ecological impacts on flora and fauna and uh, socioeconomic impacts on uh, the local rural people. But on the other hand, as we've heard, especially in the dry ecosystems, we do have a lot of positive fire impacts. We do have fire impacts on the plant level, such as that many plants are fire and smoke stimulated uh, to germinate the seeds even some plants need fire to stimulate their flowering and it is uh, uh, used to stimulate grass and plant regrowth or it is needed. The Cerrado in Brazil is a quite good example for that where uh, the golden grass of uh, the Campin Dorado is used for example for making handicrafts of the local people and uh, generate the income with that. So without using fire they cannot stimulate the grass uh, and plant regrowth of uh, this type of grass. At the landscape level fire has a positive impact when we implement prescribed or controlled burning to reduce or remove, remove uh, fuel to pre-empty dangerous wildfires and with such, of course, we also want to uh, mitigate the emissions of these uh, dangerous and large-scale wildfires. But it is also used in African countries to reduce bush encroachment and uh, thus enhance wildlife and uh, livestock management with that. 
So uh, it is used in basically all over the world for pest control to, for example, in Tanzania, get rid of the ticks um, that uh, transfer diseases to the livestock. And as said already, it is used as a land management tool for forestry to reduce the fuels uh, in agriculture to prepare agriculture fields or to uh, burn the uh, agriculture waste and for conservation reasons. So is fire now a problem or is it a solution? So traditionally, as I've said, fire management is rooted in forestry and there it has long been considered as an enemy. So the forest had to be protected against uh, fires. So firefighting was perceived the main approach within fire management because we wanted to protect our forest resources and we have neglected in many ecosystems that fire is part of uh, the ecosystem. We also have neglected that fire is not only part of certain ecosystems, but it is part of uh, uh, the land management techniques and uh, for local people. So fire is essential for rural people in many parts of the world. It is the cheap and most economic tool to do their land use and uh, natural resource management. So that's why we have to ask ourselves um, before we, we go into, into considering what is fire management all about, where uh, is burning, what is exactly burning, when it is burning and uh, who is burning for which objectives. And are these fires we are looking from above, we are looking with the satellite, is this an unwanted or is it an wanted fire? Yeah. And all these questions a fire manager has to balance. And that's why we have to look in a more holistic way on what is with integrated fire management because unwanted fires, whether they also are considered as fires producing a lot of uh, smoke and haze, hence emissions. So we want to prevent uh, these large scale destructive fires, uh, these out of control fires. We do have to have a set of certain prevention measures to uh, prevent these unwanted fires from happening at the very beginning. And we do have a set of activities, early burning or prescribed burning, belongs to prevention measures. At the community level, of course, the typical and traditional awareness and environmental education uh, uh, measures belong to that. Um, we have to look at land tenure, who owns the land, how can we make, uh, how can, can we transfer ownership for certain land uh, areas. We have to look at law compliance and law enforcement as prevention measures. And we have to look at alternatives uses of fire, alternative income generation, generating um, activities such we find in agroforestry types of systems if we talk about uh, fire prevention at community level. But nevertheless, all our prevention activities will never be as good uh, so that we don't have unwanted fires. And for these fires, we have to be prepared with a set of trained people equipment, with monitoring systems, with uh, detection and communication systems, that we can uh, take a decision um, based on mandates, policies and laws, regulations, values we want to protect. We have to define these values we want to protect so that it is clear, okay, this is an unwanted fire and who goes and tackles this fire with what sort and what type of fire equipment, which fire crew, is it from government, is it from villages, is it from the private sector, and uh, tries to initially attack this fire. Yeah. For, all we need, for all that, we need to be prepared, as I said, with uh, trained people, with the uh, respective logistics in communication and in equipment and warehousing, and the maintenance of all that. We also have to have management plans. We have to look at our plans, uh, uh, conservation management plans, 
and so forth and so on. The list is almost endless. But nevertheless, even if we try to initially attack, we might fail and we become large scale fire events, which we want to avoid by all means. And if this happens, we have to do even more mobilization of people, equipment and coordination. And we do know that even countries like the US or Australia, which have, a, uh, let's say, an almost uh, industrial industrialized uh, factory of fire suppression, they are uh, failing uh, quite often or not able to suppress these large scale fires. That's all belongs to fire suppression and response. And once a fire is out, we have to look at the area whether, whether and how we want to restore, rehabilitate, what are the measures again? Is it replanting, regrowing? Is it like in the Sahato, even using fire to restore um, uh, large areas of uh, uh, large burned areas? To do all that in a proper manner, of course, we need the support of uh, the research institutions. We need uh, to know the fire ec ecology. We want to know uh, fire danger rating uh, information. We want to know where are our firefighting resources and so on and so forth. And all that underpins um, uh, each and, each and uh, every individual element and comes uh, will be informed from from those uh, from this element. So integrated fire management is a holistic framework for managing fires in different land uses while providing co-benefits for local communities. And that it is prevention, like I said, it, it is preparedness, it is suppression, and it is restoration underpinned by research and analysis of the data to be then in a multi-stakeholder multi effort uh, be used to successfully prevent unwanted fires in which way and in which level ever has to be decided from the fire management state by the fire management stakeholders. This concept, uh, there's another concept uh, which is quite similar, integrated fire management concept after Ron Myers. It, he considers as well the um, technical fire management uh, elements like prevention, preparedness, the use of fire and suppression, and of course as well the culture and history of the fire used by local people, local communities, the socioeconomic need to use fire for their natural resource management. And of course, to consider the fire ecology of the given uh, land uh, system and the benefits and the damages to the ecosystem. So as I'm quite tight with my uh, time because I have to leave you in seven minutes, I raise a little bit through to go a in a little bit more into detail on prescribed burning and where does it come from and uh, that it is a tool for various purposes and um, not new only in forest management but it is uh, accomplishes uh, quite a lot of um, land management objectives like um, um, prescribed burning is used to construct fire breaks um, I'm quite sure that my colleague Lara Style might talk about it. It is used to reduce the fuel load and the fire hazard. This is a picture of the fire hazard in 2007 in Botswana. After 2006, there was a quite uh, heavy rainy season producing quite a lot of amount of fuel, which we try to reduce by um, uh, prescribed burning, controlled burning. And of course, hence this does also in, in uh, reduce on the fire emissions of the of the late season fires. It is, uh, as I mentioned, used for controlling uh, pests and invasive alien species. It is in Africa uh, used for wildlife management to enhance uh, grass regrowth and attract the wildlife for in the tourism industry. And again, also examples from Africa, domestic livestock and pasture management, 
um, bush encroachment, which is quite of a big problem in Africa in the meantime, um, especially for uh, livestock keepers. Um, so I see that I do not have much time left. I want to skip these uh, uh, slides. I want to quickly come back to restoration purposes. This is a picture of the Sahada of the uh, ecological station in uh, Tokanchins, um, where Jonas later on will talk about and how the fire managers there have tried with those elements of integrated fire management, um, such as prescribed burning, working with the local communities, but also with fire suppression to try to shift the, the fire regime in these vast areas. This is a landscape that has been uh, burning uh, uh, quite over and over again in the late season. So uh, the um, woody biomass has had been quite reduced and with um, controlled burning, prescribed burning over the last five years now, um, they were quite successful to change um, the fire season from late season, dangerous hot fires to early um, prescribed burning um, fires. So in summary, uh, um, integrated fire management includes technical element, elements of fire management, but also the use of fire uh, for rural people, and it considers the culture and ecology of fire. But we still, of course, need to distinguish fire dependent far versus fire sensitive ecosystem systems and understand that each requires different fire management approaches. Um, IFFM needs to balance between conservation, protection, development, livelihood goals, and emission reductions. And IFM needs to understand the underlying fire causes to find appropriate fire management solution at various levels. And that might be not really always the case that prescribed burning is the solution for the fire problem. Successful integrated fire management looks at the involvement of local communities, considering the rural socioeconomic conditions and needs. And of course, it needs the coordination of actors and stakeholders in the implementation of fire management and emission goals. It is cross cutting and there is no single department. There is no single institution that is able to really apply integrated fire management successfully. That means you have to work together with uh, a lot of other actors and stakeholders. And normally good cooperation is quite an art as we all do know. So IFM needs to have enabling policies, legislations and regulatory, regulatory frameworks at the various administrative levels. And also this is quite an art to have them all in place and be applied. With that, I said thank you, and thank you. Uh, thank I, you. and I will join you later, hopefully for the discussion. Wonderful! Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for this presentation, and I'm going to give the floor now to our next speaker, who is uh, seriously sleep deprived because it's very late for him in Australia right now. Uh, thank you, Jer, for your patience. So Jeff is a formerly TNC climate specialist, and now he's the manager of knowledge and partnerships, Cape York Natural Resource Management in Queensland, Australia. He's got a PhD in tropical rainforest ecology from James Cook University, and he has worked in a range of in a broad range of conservation capacities over three decades, ranging from field assistant, wildlife biologist, ecologist, conservation planner to CEO. In his capacity as climate specialist on the TNC, where he worked for the 14 years, Geoff focused on climate change adaptation and mitigation initiatives and spent many years working with indigenous people in Australia and the Pacific, partly on integrated fire management. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Geoff. Uh, thanks, Rosa. And um, I guess my little title here is Emissions Mitigation Opportunities for Savannah Ecosystems in Australia, Methodologies and Enabling Factors. But I guess so I'm going to actually talk to, um, if I can get my screen to work here, two seconds. There we 
you go. I'm, I'm basically going to outline a brief history of savannah burning carbon projects in Australia. So what we've actually done to reduce emissions because it's been happening here in Australia for quite a while. I'm then going to talk to briefly, briefly to the key enabling conditions that have support, supported the proliferation of our carbon projects. And to some extent, I'm going to touch on some key opportunities for other savannah countries, as um, Rose mentioned a little while ago, the incorporation of these sorts of approaches in NDCs, but also um, starting the, down that pathway of the path that we've taken in Australia to successfully reduce emissions and provide some real opportunities for our, our certainly our, for our Indigenous landholders. I'm going to take us back in time now for um, because I guess Australia, like many countries of the world, has been subject to the vagaries of um, immigration and various uh, changes that all countries have faced. So obviously Australia, like many, um, 200 plus years ago, um, Indigenous landholders wandered um, Australia, lighting fires in their traditional way um, for 50,000 years. And so Australia was very much shaped by um, Indigenous fire management. Now, with the arri arrival of white men, that fundamentally changed and Indigenous landholders were removed from their lands. And so the, the pattern of fire went from a very nuanced um, process where in, you know, the fire managers would, would move around their country, lighting small fires for a whole host of reasons, to then if you remove people from the land and remove the normal sorts of fire practices, practices that then occurred, you get late dry season wildfires in Australia. So our, our fire patterns in Australia shifted from one of lots of different fires throughout the year through to, which sort of protected the country to a large degree, to massive late dry season wildfires. So I guess we had a, um, a number of our scientists in this part of the world um, realise that fairly early in the piece. So they started down the pathway of exploring how we might go about um, reducing emissions and how we might go about uh, thinking through the mechanics of, of how, how we might do that in a practical way, but also how we might do that and measure that in a way that could be meaningfully applied in, in real world projects. So back in 2006, we had a project called the Walfa Project, which was the first project in Australia, effectively our first uh, voluntary carbon offset for Savannah Burning, where uh, a groups of folks in, in West Arnhem Land um, set about lighting uh, cool early dry season fires, which fundamentally reduced the late dry season uh, profile. And, the, and these folks have, are still operating to this day. That project is still active, but now the project is, is under the Australian regulatory carbon market. Um, Australia then obviously moved on from, we had a proof of concept project through the Walfa project that gave us um, how this might work and was at, actually already offsetting uh, emissions in, in very real terms. But then the Australian carbon market was established uh, formally in 2011, and that provided a pathway for um, the development and proliferation of carbon projects pretty much across Australia. So back in 2010, um, the Nature Conservancy, along with Pew and the Australian government and a range of other partners, purchased a station called Fish River Station, 180,000 hectare property. This particular property had a massive um, late dry season wildfire pattern of um, fires in the previous 10, 15 years. And so this was a real opportunity to, to start implementing um, the same sorts of practices that had occurred uh, for WALFA, but under Australia's regulatory carbon market. At the same time, we had a formal um, savannah burning methodology just dealing with uh, reductions in nitrous oxide and methane that um, was a formally approved under the, under the Australian government at that time. And that then allowed us to set about the process of um, conducting the early dry season fire management. This is me as a much younger person, <laughs> conducting early dry season fire management with the local traditional owners. And I guess the, 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 the great benefit of that was that we had, um, this property was established as a conservation property um, for to be handed back to the traditional owners. Um, but what was going to be the revenue stream for these folks. So the baseline for um, Fish River Station was uh, emissions of around 23,000 tonnes annually in that uh, late, with the late dry season wildfire pattern of, of um, fires. Um, but once we started setting about the implementation of the early dry season fire management, we fundamentally reduced that by um, 
about half. So you can see the blue uh, bars to the right is once we started implementing our early dry season fire management. And we, we sold our first set of carbon credits back, um, first two years of carbon credits for around half a million dollars to, to Caltex at the time, which was a, an absolute windfall and a new economy in areas where we previously didn't have incomes other than pastoral incomes, which was a paved the way for um, indigenous protected areas across uh, Northern Australia to, to really capitalize on a, a new revenue stream, but equally to provide some fantastic co-benefits for, for, those, for those particular areas. I guess the beauty, beauty of that now is that we, we had a proof of concept project um, and the proof of concept project, both Walfay and Fish River demonstrated what was possible. And, and so then we, we set about um, seed funding a whole stack of different areas. And with that, um, we had a proliferation of um, savannah burning projects across the country, uh, ultimately around 19 million hectares of savannah burning projects, offsetting a million tonnes of emissions annually. And then um, over and above that, providing more than $10 million to indigenous land managers to continue the ongoing management of their of their of their land. So it was a huge windfall for for our part of the world. I, I guess the the crucial thing uh, in Australia at the time for us with our regulatory carbon market, it went through some changes as well. So when we first started out with uh, Fish River Station, we had a carbon price um, of between uh, twenty three dollars fifty to twenty four dollars fifty a ton which is you know, a really, a really good price for carbon. Uh, then with the change of government um, to the Liberal National Party, we end up with a uh, least cost abatement um, approach that was developed. So the regulatory market fundamentally changed, but it, it fundamentally changed to a, a practice where we would only end up with between 11 and $16 a tonne. So a, a massive reduction in, in price. But the actual benefit of, about, of the new approach was they then also provide us for, provided for long-term contracts. So uh, a lot of these projects were then able to secure 10-year um, contracts to reduce emissions, which was, again, to, for, for many of these groups where um, often funding for ind Indigenous ranger programs in this part of the world is, is, you know, can be hot and cold. This provided really a, a fantastic foundation for a lot of the, for, the, for a lot of these projects, project areas. So the ERF, in its long term contracts, proved to be quite secure. So I guess what we've seen um, since basically two thousand and six and the Walfa project is we've seen a really significant increase in the area of projects, which, can, which you can see the darker line there. You can also see a really significant increase in the incomes for our Indigenous landholders. And you can also see a, a fundamental reduction in the late dry season burns. And these are the late dry season wildfires that can be quite destructive in our part of the world. So it's been, it's been absolutely transformative um, for a lot of our areas in Northern Australia and certainly for a lot of our projects in Northern Australia. So it's, a, it's fundamentally changed um, the business models for a lot of these folks from a dependence on government to you know, development of projects that generate incomes, but also provide a great many other benefits. So the other, the other thing that's occurred in Australia in more recent times, so uh, the focus in projects originally was on um, savannah burning abatement, which is really just, as I said earlier, dealing with nitrous oxide and methane reductions as a consequence of preventing late dry season wildfires. But we also realised as a, as a consequence of the, the scientists doing the great work that they've done, um, Jerry, Jeremy Russell Smith, Gary Cook et al and their teams, we, we started to understand that the sequestration components with um, uh, the change in fire management was also substantial. So we also ended up with a, a, our first sequestration and combined uh, uh, avoidance uh, mitigation method that was approved in 2018. Now, I guess the challenge with um, moving from abatement to sequestration is your projects then have to have a permanence component. So your permanent, you need a 25 year commitment to reduce those emissions. And to date, we haven't had much uptake of the sequestration methodologies because folks are still trying to understand how they might manage the risk. Um, there's risk reversal buffers and things built into the, the methodology uh, and into the regulatory market in Australia. But at the moment we've had fantastic uptake of the uh, um, emissions avoidance method because it's an annual activity. 
But once we move to sequestration, it becomes a little more complex and they're trying to understand how, how they might engage effectively in that. But the, the fundamental benefit of the sequestration component is it provides, um, at the moment, we only have one that's specifically for the dead woody component that accumulates, and that's about three times the, three times the emissions abatement for a particular area. Um, the living biomass component can be three to five times um, uh, the abatement. So you can start to see if you can start to combine um, both your sequestration and abatement components, they can be provided significant windfalls, provided you can manage the risk. And, and the same is also true for soils, um, less so in Australia, but apparently um, uh, clearly beneficial for um, Africa um, with some work by Mark Ritchie and others. So that's, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. So the emissions avoidance piece has gone through its um, scale up. We've sort of reached, not capacity, but the, it's kind of stalled at, the, at 19 million plus hectares. Where, and I guess now it's, it's trying to work out how we then proceed to, to start to consider effectively the sequestration, the uptake of sequestration projects. So I guess the, the great benefit of um, these projects in Australia has been, um, we realised that the co-benefits were fantastic. So improved biodiversity and landscape outcomes, reinvigorating cultural and, and social traditions. For many Indigenous Australians, they have a cultural obligation to conduct fire management on country. Many, many of them haven't been able to access country, so this has provided a vehicle for them to re-engage with their uh, traditional obligations. Enhanced economic development for folks, um, increased employment for Indigenous uh, rangers, um, cl climate change adaptation benefits by reducing the risk of um, wild, uh, late dry season wildfires. But if you think of somewhere like the Cerrado or Miombo or areas that might be adjacent to other rainforest systems preventing um, or helping to prevent the loss of red projects. So I think these, uh, these shouldn't be um, underestimated in terms of the benefits that can be uh, gained over and above what you might achieve in your own particular area. And the community and uh, social cultural development and empowering communities components have, have been just wonderful in Australia. So I, I guess the key enabling conditions that have enabled us to uh, really scale up and, and develop these projects and to have them proliferate as they have, the key ones have been we had a really strong scientific foundation in the first instance. So the scientists were quite visionary at the time and they they sort of preempted how this might work um, and they'd done a huge amount of work in terms of you know, emissions factors uh, all the veg mapping fire scar mapping and getting a really strong understanding as how as to how that might be applied in the context of a, a formal methodology uh, the development of the proof of concept projects in both welfare and fish river station provided clear evidence that how it could be done and the fact that it could be done. And so that was really um, paved the way for other groups to engage. We've been very fortunate in Australia to have a whole stack of indigenous ranger, ranger programs that where folks already have a solid sound knowledge of IFM, um, both cultural burning and other ways, and also the skills to apply that. And obviously for us, the regulatory carbon market was huge to actually have the finances to incentivize projects and for projects to be formally developed um, and to be paid for those emissions reductions has been a, a massive windfall. Obviously, part of, uh, as part of all of that, the fundamental basis for the measurement of the emissions reductions is the approved uh, Savannah burning abatement and now sequestration methodologies. And I, I, I wouldn't, um, I would also really um, express the value of some of the key tools that we've had in Australia that have helped us um, do both the fire planning, but also to calculate the baselines and emissions reduction. So we actually have tools readily available to everybody where they can do their fire planning. Um, so NAFI is the site and SAVBAT are some tools that are linked to NAFI that were developed by the Australian government that allow us to do the calculations of baselines for any particular geography and the emissions reductions once a project's underway. So they're kind of the key enabling conditions that I, I would, um, I guess I'd focus on. So I guess the, the, the great success that we had um, in Australia 
um, made myself and a range of others, uh, my colleagues, Nick Wolf and Eddie Game, think, well, well, okay, so that's what's possible in Australia. How might it apply elsewhere in the world? So our methodology uh, only applies down to 600 um, millimetres rainfall. So we, this is 600 millimetres rainfall above, and also we only applied it to tropical savannas as formally classified. So areas like some of the, um, the Southeast Asian forests don't occur on this, but that would be equally relevant to them. But anyway, this gives people a snapshot of where the opportunities sit. So in the upper, upper figure, the areas that are red are clearly where where there's basically a really a preponderance of late dry season wildfires. So these are, are really the opportunities that exist um, around the world right now. Um, we've done some very you know, um, back of the envelope preliminary calculations as to what those emissions reductions might be. And folks can freely use those if in, as preliminary estimates for NDCs, should they choose um, as a pathway to help them um, move down down the same path that we've been in Australia. Um, options for global scale up, as I said, um, provisions to use these, these values we've already calculated. As I say, they're, they're very simplistic, but they're still a starting point for inclusion in NDCs. Um, but, the, but the other piece I guess I would flag is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. We have a number of method, uh, methodologies that have been developed here in Australia that that could be readily adapted for other parts of the world and populated with the parameters and emissions factors relevant to their geographies. So for the Cerrado or Miombo. So um, these could be developed under the VCS or similar. Um, and the 2015 methodology would be the one that would be um, probably easiest for folks to um, digest and understand and to adapt. So that's... Um, Kind of where uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for folks to um, consider. Um, I've added a, just an extra slide with some of the key resources so people can access those when they choose. And I might uh, stop there. Thank you That's very all. much, Joe. Uh, no because it's so late, it's because it's so late for Joe. Let uh, um, uh, participants, if you have a quick question for him, please put it on the Q&A. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you something, and thank you so much for this very, very informative um, presentation. Uh, one of the problems that we have with national um, regulated carbon markets is the cost of verification. So we have been discussing that, for instance, for blue carbon. And um, because all these uh, carbon offsets need to be additional, and then they need to be verified in order to be receiving the payments, how did you solve the verification process of, of the abatement of the emissions? Uh, so we, our projects are audited here in Australia. They might be done once every two or three years. Um, it depends on the project. But um, so ours are formally audited by um, accredited auditors in Australia. So that's the that's the current process as it stands. So you know the, every I mean, the the obviously the tools that we're using um, already um, are used in national carbon accounting, but they're also um, they've been proven. The, the tools and the and the estimates that they provide provide credible results. We also do a whole stack of validation of um, veg maps as part of our projects and things as well, and and the fires fires that have occurred as well. So, but the the auditing process is 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 comprehensive, and every project is subject to that. Excellent, excellent. Um, let me open the questions to the panelists while I look to the Q and A's in case uh, some of you have any questions. Okay, um, Jeff, I actually dumbfounded. Do... No, it's actually, I do have so many questions. Let me just ask you one more question. Someone just sure. put a question about Pantanal. And I think Pantanal is a very, very interesting question and, and a bit of a drama to have to discuss how much it has burned this year. Uh, but Pantanal is a wetland, uh, the yeah. same way that Indonesian fires are wetlands. And many of them would also have grasslands and, and not necessarily uh, woody vegetation. And one could say, well, um, when we talk about um, the scalability of your method, what would be the warnings that you would be, uh, so that it's not only um, that you need to focus on uh, non woody vegetation, but also you need to make sure that you are under the same ecosystem type. Could you give some warning for this scaling up? 
Well, I, I, I guess, you know, part of it's, you know, um, doing the math. I think that the important thing with this is if, if the patterns in the Pantanal are for a preponderance of late dry season wildfires, then your opportunity to reduce those is probably significant, you know, um, in terms of using your integrated fire management in a meaningful way. So I think, I think, I think um, you know, anywhere where the, if you look at the, I guess, the fire profile for the, for the year, where you see, a, sorry, let's just stop doing this thing. If you if you look at the fire profile, if there if if there is a tendency, and you look at it from the standpoint of a baseline, where you can say, well, legitimately, the fires in the Pantanal over the last decade have been extremely large, and they've been in the late dry season. Then I don't know the Pantanal personally, but um, but if that's if that's the case, then that clearly speaks to the opportunity for emissions reductions if you can fundamentally reduce that pattern of the late dry season wildfires, which by and large have very large emissions. So that's you know I would say that wherever whatever the system that uh, savanna systems that might exist out there in the world where that pattern occurs, there is the opportunity to significantly reduce emissions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Fully, fully agreed. Like analysis of, of how are the fire patterns before. Um, also, if Anya was here, I'm sure she would say, well, remember that um, integrated fire management needs to adjust different options for different ecosystems and see which of these options would be the best. But um, that is also very, very interesting. Any ex ah, we have two questions. Wait, so and we let you go to rest. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> it's it's one twenty two a.m. here. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> it is time for you. I think. Uh, I'm happy yeah, to answer. Someone a asked for the carbon credit, but I think I think we're gonna. Okay, very quick question from um, Karam Khan. Could uh, any of you please elaborate about the carbon credit? Um, how how did the well? The question is how it could be sell and buy. This is a too long of a question, but I think what is interesting is how Australia defined the cost of or, or the price of the carbon credit. And with that, we will finish and let you sleep. Uh, well, I think the price of the carbon credits is an interesting one. I think I think industry when when the so when we effectively had a carbon tax under the carbon farming initiative. I think the industry probably had some discussions with government saying, well, we could live with about this this um, this level of taxing. So that was when uh, I think at that stage it was between actually between $23.50 and $24.50 a ton. Um, once the so that was under the Labor government, once the um, Liberal National Government got in that they went to a much more conservative approach and a lease cost abatement. So that's when we suddenly went to a price. So the government's setting the price is I guess the, the fund, fundamental answer to that. The government set the price for the tax in the first instance under the, under the CFI, but then under the emissions reduction, they fundamentally reduced the price of carbon uh, to between ten and sixteen dollars a ton. So that's that's where it fell after that. But so gov government has set um, the price for a tax. For a tax. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff. Okay. I think it's time for you to sleep. Thank you so very much. Right, everybody. Bye, Jeff. Thanks so rest. much. Good, <laughs> bye. good Thank luck with the so rest much. of the call. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers. Bye bye. Bye, Jeff. See you. Okay. Well. Thanks kindly to Jeff. It's 1.30 for him in Australia, so uh, a warm thanks. Our next speaker, um, please, um, um, Jonas, could you start sharing your screen? Let me introduce you. We're going to have um, two speakers in one, in one chat. We're going to have Lara Steil from the Brazilian National Center for Prevention and Fighting Wildfires. Uh, Lara holds a PhD in civil engineer and she joined Prefogo Ibama in 2005 as an environmental analyst. Uh, she counts on 15 years of experience in fire management and she is the coordinator of the interagency department promoting national and international cooperation and the development of activities related to integrated fire management with indigenous and rural communities. Lara will be explaining us a bit the governance setting for prescribed burning in in the Cerrado uh, ecosystem. So, Lara, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Rosa, and uh, good day to everybody. I would like to to say thanks to the organizers of the, the event and uh, greetings to the audi audience. It's a pleasure for me to to be here and uh, and share this uh, presentation. 
I will, uh, together with Jonas later, uh, share some information and thoughts uh, regarding integrated fire management in the, in the Cerrado ecosystem. Uh, Jonas, if you can go to the next, uh, please. The slide. Oh, thank you. You have 15 and minutes, Lara. Okay. <laughs> I think it will be like 10 minutes because uh, I planned for that. Wonderful, uh, wonderful. Okay. So for, for starting, I will show you just a quick view of uh, Brazil. Uh, Brazil is a huge country with a total area of 80.5 million square kilometers. About half of this area is covered by natural vegetation. And uh, in Brazil, we, we have uh, five human ecosystems. And uh, I will focus my presentation today in, in Cerrado. Next, please. 25% uh, of uh, the area of Brazil is covered by Cerrado. And in Cerrado, we have many protected areas. 80.2% of the total area is protected by conservation units. Uh, also in Cerrado, we have 4.3% uh, of the total area occupied by indigenous lands. Uh, it's important to highlight here that indigenous and traditional communities play an important role on environmental protection in Brazil. Uh, Cerrado is, uh, um, has a, 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 a long history with, uh, with fire. It's uh, uh, an, an ecosystem adapted to fire. And also Cerrado is considered the, the richest biodiversity savanna in the world. And it has many different uh, physiognomies, as you can see in, the, in these uh, photos, in this slide. And uh, Jonas will talk, uh, talk about this uh, a little bit more later. Uh, next, please. Uh, along the years, uh, Cerrado has been affected negatively by changes in fire regimes and wildfires, with many extensive and frequent late season wildfires. In uh, estimates uh, carried out in 2012, was found that 60% of the greenhouse uh, gas emissions related to land use and related to fire and deforestation came from Cerrado. With the lack of an effective program for fire protection and the a poly, a police of zero fire, where the total suppression of fire from the ecosystems was the focus, we observed biodiversity loss and increasing in GAG emissions. In addition to that, and uh, considering the zero fire policy and the presence of many indigenous communities in Cerrado, we also met losses of traditional and indigenous uh, knowledge on fire use. And with this uh, situa situation, we started to rethink our strategies. Next, please. Um, we carried out activities with the indigenous communities in order to understand their knowledge about the, the use of fire in the ecosystem. Together with them, we developed uh, monthly calendars showing the key natural resources and associated damage potential caused by uh, fire according to the period of the year. As you can see in the chart in the next slide. Next, oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, if we use fire at the end of a rainy season or at the beginning of a dry season, season represented uh, by the green uh, arrows, the main resources of the environment are not badly affected, unlike some of them can be positively influenced by this uh, good fire. On the other hand, the late, dry, the late uh, season fire represented uh, in the chart by the red arrows will damage most part of the environmental uh, resources. Next. Uh, taking into account, account all these issues, Brazil started a paradigm shift 
From fire management main focused on fire suppression, we began to look to fire as a management tool. Thanks to an international cooperation project with uh, Germany, the Cerrado Jalapão project, Brazil is advancing to the integrated fire management approach, including one of its strategy, uh, the prescribed burnings. The integrated fire management approach and the prescribed, prescribed burnings is started in a few indigenous lands and the conservation units as you can see in, in this figure of the Cerrado Jalapão project. And next, uh, soon with the, the, pro, the project, uh, the, acti the activities of uh, integrated fire management were expanded to other areas. We initiated in only three ind indigenous lands in Cerrado, Cerrado. Nowadays, Integrated fire management occurs in 52% of the total indigenous lands in Cerrado. In the same way, integrated fire uh, activities began in two conservation units and by uh, 2019, uh, 36 conservation units were involved in this process. Next. For uh, indigenous lands, we developed a methodology starting with the indigenous traditional knowledge about fire in the ecosystem. It's a participatory methodology that includes technological strategies as the fuel load maps, the definition of, of objectives and priority areas for conservation, uh, the implementation of prescribed burnings, and the evaluation and monitoring of the effects of fire as a follow-up of the, the, the process. Next. Uh, specifically for indigenous lands, we defined the periods of prescribed burnings according to this chart. So we have what we call early prescribed fire in rainy season mid prescribed fire at the end of the rainy season and the late prescribed fire at the beginning of the dry season, each one of them with its own main objective. In this context, the fires at the late dry season are considered uncontrolled fires and they are to be avoided. Next, please. Uh, the preliminary results for indigenous lands indicate that the increasing prescribed burning approach means to decrease areas affected by wildfires, as you can see in these uh, uh, two graphs. Next, please. Uh, analyzing the mortality of trees uh, in, in the graph of uh, at, at left side, we found that along three years of evaluation, the areas managed with prescribed fire presented the lowest mortality rate when compared with the fire exclusion and the areas affected by uh, wildfires. The areas affected by wildfires presented the highest mortality rate. In the graph at, uh, at the right, uh, we are comparing the three prescribed uh, fire regimes. And what uh, uh, we can see as the early prescribed fires show the lowest mortality rate compared to mid and the late prescribed fires. Next, please. Uh, results of the integrated fire management in conservation units show a tendency of a decrease of areas affected by wildfires, represented by the red uh, in, in the bars. Uh, when fire management is, is applied, uh, represented by the green and the, and the gray bars in, 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 in the graph. Next one, please. In the specific case of uh, ecological station Serra Geral do Tocantins, uh, in the left graph, uh, the, ana the analysis of the percentage of burned area shows clearly that at the same time that the early dry season fires are applied, represented by the green line, 
the area affected by late dry season fires, represented by the red line, decreases. Uh, Lara, two in the more minutes. Yes? Sorry to interrupt, two more minutes. No problem. Ah, thank okay. You. Ah, thank you. Okay. Yes, it's, it's also part of these results uh, are going to be shown by Jonas. So let's move quickly from these results and uh, focus on. I have just one more uh, slide, Rosa. Okay. If you let me finish, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Comparing the largest fire area along the years, we can see that before integrated fire management, that means 2010 to 2013, only one wildfire could hit an area of 100,000 hectares. And after the integrated fire management activities implementation uh, from 2015 to 2019, this uh, pattern changes. Next, please. So what are our challenges and what do we expect it for the future? In 2016, Brazil adopted Paris Agreement and established our nationally determined contributions. And uh, for contribute to Brazilian commitments, uh, fire issues must be uh, tackled by multi stakeholders, including government agencies, private sector, communities, NGOs, indigenous and traditional people. Therefore, our challenge in the near future is to improve integrated fire management in the whole country and uh, in coordination with all these stakeholders. We need to understand the impact of fires on the GAG emission. It's mandatory uh, to have a fire emission baseline and estimates. It's crucial to develop a three government level competence if we want to be effective and efficient. Brazil needs to have a national policy on integrated fire management, and indeed we have a proposal for this uh, policy since uh, 2018, and the proposal is uh, at the National Congress, but <clears throat> until now the document was not discussed inside the Congress. And finally, the coordination among all the agencies involved is very important, and uh, as well as with the civil society. Well, I finished uh, my participation and I leave this stage to Jonas. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Um, we're going to open the space for Jonas and uh, we will open some questions for um, the panelists, uh, for the participants later on. Jonas, okay. uh, let me introduce you. Let me introduce you. Um, Please. Jonas. Frank, he works for Remote Sensing Solutions and holds a PhD on geography from the University of Bonn. And his expertise lies on earth observation and environmental monitoring for a wide range of applications such as fire management, sustainable agriculture, forestry, public health, or renewable energy. His focus is to implement innovative methods into operational practices that support policy development. He advises organizations on conservation, risk assessment, and monitoring techniques, and he has been working on Serato fuel management since 2014. The floor is yours, Jonas. Thank you very much, uh, Rosas. Thank you very much, Lara, for setting the Cerrado scene here. Um, it's a pleasure to share a presentation with you. So um, I will start my presentation with a look back to the year 2014, when actually inter uh, integrated fire management was introduced in the Cerrado. Um, back then, I was involved in a Brazilian-German cooperation project, uh, prevention, control, and monitoring of wildfires in the Cerrado, which was funded by the German Ministry for Environment, BMUB. So our role was to figure out together with my, my Brazilian colleagues how earth observation can support the process of IFM implementation. So and what we found is uh, so we identified a high demand uh, for geospatial data on fuel loads and fuel distribution for the planning of the early dry season prescribed burning. So that was the time when the fuel load uh, mapping approach was developed that uses a special type of a spectral mixture analysis for Landsat data later also Sentinel-2, that maps the amount of green and dry vegetation and also uh, their densities. So the planning of the fuel management could be directly supported by uh, the fuel lot maps in terms of where, when, and how to burn. So the fuel lot maps were quite a success and through capacity development, um, the approach could be established as an operational tool in the Cerrado. Um, so, um, and it, it was also kind of incorporated into drafts of IFM policies in Brazil. So, next slide. 
There we go. So the benefit of the fuel of maps, um, I don't go into the methodologic, methodological details here. There's a paper on it. If you need some detail, details, I'm happy to share the paper with you. But uh, the main benefits of this fuel of mapping approach for the integrated fire management was that there is up-to-date geospatial information on the fuel condition, fuel load, and also fuel connectivity that helps to plan and prioritize the early dry season prescribed burning in the field, um, but also to evaluate the effects of the IFM strategies. And that's particularly what I would like to talk about today, uh, about the effects of the IFM, what, what we see today. So um, we had now the question in the, in, in the kinds of six years later, there's this um, kind of interesting project funded by C4 and USAID and, um, and Seeger. Um, where we are now evaluating the effect of the IFM operation, also in terms of the greenhouse gas mitigation potentials. So uh, we are actually addressing some main questions here. So was the fragmentation of the fire regime successful? So was pyrodiversity achieved? Could the IFM and particularly the increased early dry season pre scrap burning change the seasonality of fire? We've heard about that uh, important aspect earlier. And if yes, did that also lead to reduction of the mid and late dry season burnt areas? Another question was, uh, Jeff was already mentioning that re regarding to, uh, towards sequestration. Is there also a change in the amount of biomass or combustible fuel in the areas with IFM? And we are applying the IPCC approach um, in order to find out if those IFM operations could abate greenhouse gas emissions. So a first step to do so is um, to allow kind of a large scale mapping of the fuel loads. Um, our colleagues from, from ECMBU and also IBAMA um, translated that approach into the Google Earth engine in order to provide the fuel load maps much large, much, uh, for much larger areas and much faster to the protected areas managers. So that was a great first step um, for, for this large scale mapping. What we did, we modified that a little bit so uh, that we can also have a combustible biomass model in order to translate the values from the fuel load map into quanti quantitative tons per hectare combustible biomass values. So for that, we used pre and post fire collected biomass samples from the University of Brasilia. Um, and um, to actually establish that combustible biomass model, which is Cejado specific. So that was the first step to allow the analysis of the uh, IFM mitigation potentials at a large scale. So this map shows you actually the status of the pre scrap burning in protected areas at, at, the, at 2020. So we did an inventory of who's doing what in the protected areas here. So you see the, here the uh, biome of the Cejado with the national parks and the ecological stations. Um, which are mainly managed by ECMBU, and you see the uh, indigen indigenous areas with um, the red and, and the yellow shows you those areas which already have a pre scrub burning activity in 2020. So um, from these kind of areas, we picked them with the longest history of integrated fire management activities. So th these were mainly uh, the indigenous land of Xerenche, that is the ecological station of Serra Geral de Tocantins, the National Park Chapata das Mesas and Park Estadual de Xalapao. And now we are looking back the six years IFM history to compare the results and the effect, how IFM was effective and compare that to protected areas without IFM. These protected areas which were selected were also based on similar uh, characteristics like um, size, um, amount of rainfall, location, and things like that. So the first thing we analyzed was um, the fragmentation. So the question was actually, how uh, did the process of fragmenting the fire regime go over the last six years? So you can, this actually, this process can nowhere better be seen as in the ecological station of Serra Geral de Tocantins. Um, I also saw some participants, uh, Marco and Carola, in, in, in this webinar here. So these are the heads behind the fire management in this area. 
This area was uh, one of the largest, uh, is a large area, which was one of the most frequently burned areas in the Cerrado. So it's a, a kind of pretty, some parts are very degraded, degraded places. So here you see a few lot map um, in, from 2014. So you see very large uh, burned areas in this blue colors here in the fuel lot map, and also large areas that have a similar high amount of fuel that are prone to burn pretty soon. So six years later, you actually see the success of this fragmentation. So the whole fire regime was changed into a mosaic style, um, small scale fragments of different fire regimes. So pyrodiversity was kind of achieved here and the, the large scale high intensity fires do not longer occur. So uh, Carol and Marco, this, this is your, your success here. Well, when we are talking about emissions, we also have to talk about, um, let's say the, the seasonality of the fire. For that, we compared for the four protected areas with integrated fire management and the protected areas without integrated fire management about more than 20,000 hotspots over the last six years. What you see here in bold, you see the protected areas without IFM and with the dotted line, you see the protected areas with IFM. And besides the fact that even after three years or two years of integrated fire management, um, catastrophic fires and mega fire years like 2015 or 2017 could be mitigated through integrated fire management, you see a clear shift in the seasonality. So from the late, mid and late dry season fires, more fires early dry season, which are mainly due to the prescribed burning there. But talking about emissions, when we would like to calculate emissions, we have to talk about also uh, the effect of IFM on uh, the burned area, because the burned area is one uh, factor in the equation of the IPCC approach when emissions are calculated. So here, um, all, put, all burned areas from the MODIS um, uh, burned area product, are, Oh, sorry, I'm still talking about I'm still talking about the hotspots from the modus hotspots are ca characterized um, early, mid, and late dry season fires. And you here see there's a significant trend of increased early dry season fires by also reduced mid and late dry season fires for the protected areas with IFM. Okay, you can argue that um, of course that, that might be related to climate, um, but when we compare the same uh, same uh, period for protected areas without IFM, we don't see any clear trend. So that is definitely the effect of integrated fire management that, um, that there's a shift in seasonality. Also in terms of burned area, here we uh, calculated the early dry season in brownish colors and the mid and late dry season burned areas in blue. And there's a significant trend of reduced mid and late dry season burned areas through integrated fire management, um, which indicates a reduction of minus 66% of the mid and late dry season fires. Um, the early dry season fires were increased from very low levels um, by about uh, 69%. So this is kind of the baseline. So here is a, a kind of a potential for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. In order to calculate uh, non-CO2 related greenhouse gas emission potentials, um, we were using the IPCC um, approach. Um, it, it must be mentioned that uh, CO2 emissions are not reported under IPCC for savanna type non-forest fires due to the assumption that the CO2 emissions would be counterbalanced by the CO2 removals from the subsequent regrowth. So, but meth uh, methane and nitrous oxide emissions um, are persistent in the atmosphere and are thus accountable here. So this uh, is the reason why uh, under the IPCC approach, um, we cal calculated the non-CO2 greenhouse gas mitigation potentials using that equation that Rosa already showed in, the, in, in her first slides. So for the factor A, which is the burned area, we are using the earth observation data from the burned areas from MODIS. And then for MB, which is the mass of fuel available for combustion, we are using the fuel load maps. So usually um, you can use default uh, values from the, from the tables uh, IPCC is providing, but with having kind of a Cejado specific combustible biomass model using the fuel load maps, we can even have higher tier levels maybe 
going to tier two or tier, tier three. So we have up-to-date information about available combustible biomass per pixel at 30 meter spatial resolution. Jonas, and three for, more minutes. Yes, thanks. And so for the combustion factor um, and the emission factor, these are default values from IPCC. So let's say the math is still ongoing. So um, this is uh, uh, kind of uh, calculations we are doing, uh, doing these days, but we try to upscale the, the estimated greenhouse gas mitigation potentials using this IPCC approach. So given that baseline that we found with the shift in the burn areas uh, from the four protected areas with IFM, the following non-CO2 greenhouse gas abatement potentials through IFM estimated. So the abatement potential of, for all PAs, for all protected areas in the Zihado would be about, about 1.7 megaton CO2 equivalents over a period of six years. That is approximately uh, 0.3 megatons per year. And the abatement potential for the whole Zihado would be 17.8 megatons CO2 equivalents over the same period. Um, equals to almost three megatons CO2 equivalents per year. But saying that, we are calculating that in more detail. These are preliminary results and must be confirmed soon. One last thought, um, picking up Jeff's idea about not talking about abatement, but also about sequestration. We were also analyzing the, uh, the effect of integrated fire management on the late dry season fuel load. So what's after a fire year, what's still there in terms of, com of combustible biomass. And we analyzed that using uh, the six years uh, we, we were looking at. And here you see that there is actually um, 0.3 tons per hectare accumulation of combustible biomass uh, in the protected areas with IFM. So there, that means that uh, the fragmentation leads to longer um, um, regeneration cycles and uh, longer fire return intervals, which means that vegetation can kind of um, accumulate biomass. So this uh, total, for the four protected areas, that uh, sums up to a total increase of approximately 350,000 tons of biomass, which is approximately 150,000 tons of carbon stored on top. So this is that's because of the fact and idea that additional greenhouse gas mitigation potentials through sequestration can be very interesting. On the left-hand side, you see a typical burn area approximately two, two months after a burn. So there's actually not much organic material in the upper soil layer. There's no litter, nothing. And even the small um, tree species trying to grow, but can only do sprouting and sprouting because they get a, get a canopy kill after two, after three years all the time. So they cannot really grow above certain thresholds. And having more fragments into the situation, which you see on the right-hand side, there is a good potential of sequestration through the dead carbon litter pool, the soil carbon, uh, and also the woody thickening part. So this must be also an uh, interesting part of uh, sequestration, not only abatement. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas, and, and thank you, Laura. I think Brazil has shown a spectacular example of governance, of fire management governance. And I actually think that uh, from what Lara was mentioning before, all the efforts that um, have been done to train the indigenous communities to the very successful implementation rates, uh, and then the results that both Lara and yourself were showing, this is a spectacular, spectacular um, implementation policy success. Um, uh, two questions, please. One goes to Lara. Um, Lara, uh, what would be your recommendation in terms, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen such a successful implementation program for fire management that has led to such excellent results. Uh, two questions. Who, in terms of governance, what would be your uh, lessons learned for other colleagues that may want to start applying uh, some integrated fire management? And the other is, how would emission abatement affect the frail, the red plus frail um, commitment for the Cerrado? Do you think it could be incorporated somehow within the frail mitigation targets? And this goes to Lara, Jonas, these two. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, uh, thank you, Raza. Well, uh, regarding the, the first uh, question, I think that we are still learning the lessons because we are in the process of implementing uh, integrated fire management in, in Brazil. But uh, by now, what I would say is that the integration of agencies and uh, also um, to be connected with the communities, it's uh, two key points for implementation of integrated fire management. Because I, um, you said that uh, we have many trainings to indigenous people, but we have many lessons from them to us. We learned a lot from them because they have been in Cerrado area for thousands of years and they know how to manage uh, to manage that. Regarding the second question, I think that uh, we need, first of all, as, as I said in, in, in my, my last uh, slide, we, we need to have a baseline of the emissions uh, regarding fire, and we don't have this uh, yet. So first step is to have this baseline of uh, emis emissions caused by, by fires in, in, in Brazil. And so uh, after that, we can see what to do with this information and, and uh, we will be uh, able to measure uh, how much we are avoiding emissions with this uh, approach of integrated fire management. I don't know if, I, if you are satisfied okay, with much. my... Very much. Thank actually, you. it's actually very interesting. And I put one more question and I move on. We need to move on. Uh, one also will go to Jonas. Um, for the baseline, the, the way that Australia has estimated the baseline has been the difference between the late dry season and the early dry season. But I guess there might be other ways of, of doing it. Do you have any hints of, of what would be of a preference or because you already have enough information from from the shift of emissions from late dry season into early dry season, right, Nara? Yeah, well, I think that we, we, we started the integrated fire man management in 2014, 2015, depending on, on the area that we are talking about. And um, we, well, I, I think that we, 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 we need to, to, to really understand how these uh, 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 emissions that we are avoiding the late dry season, indeed, well, I, I mean, we, we, we need to measure uh, how much we are avoiding, you know, we, we don't know this properly, you know, we need to have this, we, there are many methodologies to do it, but at a state level, I mean, at the government level, we are not doing that for fire. And so we need to, to have a methodology for that. Understood. Thank you. And for Jonas, two questions for you. Um, some colleagues of yours are asking if the GEE codes for the fuel loads would be shared. <laughs> that was one. And then someone asks, what is the difference between combustible biomass and just fuel available and, and, and biomass, basically? Um, well, so first question I cannot answer because this is actually um, the ownership is with the Brazilian colleagues and uh, ECMBU and IBAMA who actually implemented that in the Google Earth engine. Um, so no answer here, sorry for that. But uh, the second question is um, the fuel load maps are showing the fractions of dry biomass, green biomass, and let's say that their densities per pixel in percentage kind of. Um, that doesn't relate directly to a kilogram per square meter, but by using these pre and post fire biomass samples, which we got from the University of uh, Brasilia, they actually um, took biomass before fire and after fire, then they tried it. Um, so they ex exactly know what part of the biomass, which we see in the satellite data pre and post fire actually was combusted. So, and we use that data to set up this model transforming the values from the fuel load map into the combustible, combustible biomass map in kilograms uh, per, per square meter, tons per hectare, whatever. And this can be directly used for this IPCC formula to uh, calculate emissions. The emissions. Thank you so much, Jonas. I know Lara needs to go and thank you so much, Lara. I know you are very busy and it's also the working time for you. Someone is asking,
asking you, um, could you please comment the participation on the Ministerio do Medio Ambiente on the implementation of the fire management project in the Brazilian Cerrado? Yes, of course, uh, uh, IBAMA and the ECMEB, we are two agencies linked to, to the Ministry for Environment and they are uh, with us and uh, the Ministry for Environment are responsible for implementing the policies. So in uh, the National Policy for Inter Integrated Fire Management that I mentioned was uh, built together with the Ministry for Environment here in Brazil. So they have uh, participation in the whole process. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the international project, uh, cooperation project we uh, had with uh, Germany, the Cerrado Jalapão project, the coordinator of the project from Brazil side was uh, the Ministry for Environment. So they are <laughs> full involved in, in, in this process. Very much, thank you. Thank you so much, Lara. Thank you for your time. Thank you for fantastic presentation and congratulations thank for amazing implementation of, of prescribed burning. Thank, thank you. you so much, Jonas. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. Okay, uh, let, let me offer the, open the floor then to our next speaker, who would be uh, the coordinator of the Southern Miombo uh, Network, if I said that correctly, Natasha Ribeiro uh, from the University Eduardo Montlane. She was born in Maputo, Mozambique, and she holds a PhD on environmental sciences from the University of Virginia in the US. <clears throat> Excuse me. She comes on 25 years of experience on forest restoration, and she's coordinated the Miombo Network of Southern Africa since 2011. And also she's running long-term ecological research in the Niasa National Reserve, Northern Mozambique. We are looking forward to hearing about uh, Miombo. Thanks very much, uh, Natasha. Thanks, Rosa. Um, can you see my screen? I'm not sure if I'm sharing. Yes, this. yes, we can. You need to maximize it. Okay. Is it fine now? It is perfect now, Natasha. Go ahead. Many thanks. Much, Rosa. I would like to also thank the organizers of this webinar. It's a pleasure to me to be here and be able to share my experience uh, on fires in the Miombo lands uh, of Mozambique. So I apologize in advance for a long title, but uh, basically I'm going to be talking about fires in the context of the Miombo lands in, in Mozambique. Um, apart of representing the Miombo network, I'm also uh, working for the Eduardo Mondlane University in Maputo, Mozambique. So let me first introduce you to uh, the Miombo lands of Southern Africa. They are the largest dry tropical forest ecosystem in the world, as you can see. Uh, in the top map, the green uh, areas are the, the dry forest ecosystems in Miombo in Southern Africa are by far the largest uh, uh, ecosystem. So uh, the, the recent estimations of Miombo uh, points to 1.9 million square kilometers in, across seven countries uh, in Southern Africa. I should say that this is a one third decrease in the area since uh, the last estimations in from white in 1983. Well, a part of its uh, uh, extension, uh, Miombo are also very important ecologically and socially. They are called social woodlands. Uh, they are very diverse in terms of plant species and uh, very uh, high levels of endemism as well. And they represent habitat for important wildlife species such as the me mega herbivores and the wide variety of carnivores. Uh, interesting about Miombo and uh, comparable to the Cerrado, it's that uh, it's a very disturbance-driven uh, ecosystem. Being fire, the topic of our discussion today, just one of the, the factors. Uh, socially, the Miombo provides goods and services for uh, a large proportion of the population, uh, both rural and urban uh, population in Southern Africa. And because of this long-term uh, relationship, the Miombo, uh, the, there are intrinsic uh, interactions between people and the woodlands. And these interactions need to be taken into consideration when managing uh, the woodlands. So the pictures is just, uh, are just a few illustrations of the, the, Miombo, the resources from, uh, from Miombo uh, providing uh, uh, support to the livelihoods of uh, our uh, population. 
Um, well, fires are part of the Miambo ecology. They have been there since many time, many years now. They, they have probably arrived with people. We always say that the people are the natural causes of fire in Miambo. And they use, uh, they use the fire as the, the ma a major management tool uh, for almost all activities such as hunting, sheep cultivation, honey gathering, and other activities. So because of this uh, long-term relationship, really most plant species in Miombo are adapted to fires and other even depend on fires to regenerate, to germinate, to flowering, etc. The thing is that the fire regimes are very important and they are changing as uh, Rosa mentioned and Annie also mentioned in, at the beginning. The fire regimes are changing, but uh, uh, very few experiences in uh, IFM exist in, in the region. And in Mozambique, there are non-IFM uh, uh, experiences. So when we talk about fire regimes in, in Miombo, uh, we say that the normal fire frequency, it's every two to three years when the gas fuel uh, on the, in the understory burns, and these are important to maintain the ecosystem as it is uh, known, Miombo, but a change in, to hot annual fires can degrade the ecosystem and impose several structural and um, compositional changes to the ecosystem. So now let me talk about the Niasa Special Reserve, uh, which is the place where I've been working for the last six, uh, 16 years now. Uh, so the, the Niasa Special Reserve is not just the largest protected area in Mozambique, but is also the largest protected area in Miombo woodlands worldwide. So Niasa is uh, located in the very north of Mozambique in the border with Tanzania, and it has undergone several management systems since its creation in the 1950s. Uh, so what's so special about Niasa? Well, the combination of factors, uh, vegetation uh, covered most, mostly by uh, Niambo lands, wildlife, a part of elephants, there are other mega herbivores, and also a large population of the herbivores. Uh, well, as yes, any other uh, protected, protected area in the country, there are population with, human population living in, in Niasa Reserve, uh, 60,000 people, and depending on forest resources and of course using fire as a management tool. So with this inspiration in mind, I started my, my research back in 2004, where I established permanent sample plots and I've been monitoring uh, vegetation according to the fire uh, issues. So I'm presenting some of my results here. The top map is the fire frequency map uh, from MODIS. Uh, from 2000 to 2012, showing that the most of the, the reserve burns with the normal regime of every two, uh, three years, but there is a large proportion also of 45% of the reserve burning annually. So the regime is uh, already changing in the reserve. The graphs on the bottom, they show uh, uh, results from the four mind gap model, uh, which was calibrated from our field data. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, it shows uh, that uh, changing the fire regime from no fire on the left. So the graph shows the net ecosystem exchange uh, over the 600 years of our simulation. And the left graph is the no fire regime in which the, the ecosystem is uh, carbon natural like maturity. But then if uh, the, the system burns annually, the, the, the system can be converted in a carbon source. Uh, so showing that fire management is important in the system. Of course, we don't want a situation of no fires. So maintaining the three uh, fire frequency of every three years, it's probably the best option in this context. Uh, the modeling data agrees well with our field data showing in this graph that the fire frequency, the furthest to the right, is the annual fire frequency in which the carbon uh, annual increment is, uh, uh, significantly reduced compared to uh, low fire frequencies. Um, uh, we also have shown, I'm not, I'm not sh uh, showing here the results, but we have proved also that uh, there are also compositional and structural differences linked to fires across the Nyasa Reserve. And they are shown here uh, in these pictures. Um, well, I would like also to briefly mention about this USAID funded project that uh, it's bringing now new elements to our 
research. Basically, we want to uh, explore more in depth the relationship between fires and elephants uh, as uh, engineers of the ecosystem, as you can see on the bottom pictures. But also we wanna bring the, the, the dimension of the, the human population living in the reserve, uh, understanding their practices, their traditional knowledges on fire management. And as Lara said, it's very important that we understand how they, they use fires so we can better frame uh, IFM program for next. Uh, so this is a very, uh, we, it's a still ongoing uh, project, so we don't have results to show here, but uh, we'll be having results soon. So fire management in Mozambique, uh, here it's a, a bit of a sample of the legal framework in Mozambique, as you can see. Uh, in general, the, the legal framework is very prohibitive. The forest law and its regulation talk about fire prevention and state fire fires as a crime. Um, there's a bit of fire management in the regulation, but just uh, mentioning fire breaks. The recent forest policy from 2019 also talks about coercive measure, measures to avoid the fires, but uh, uh, states the need to prevent, control, and combat fires. Our Mozambique, our action plan on preventing and controlling fires is out of date now, but again, it's very prohibitive. And it doesn't mention the fire management at all in the in the document. So uh, uh, fire IFM in our uh, NDCs, uh, Mozambique has submitted the NDCs to the UNFCCC. Uh, it uh, states that the the national strategy on uh, adaptation, uh, adapting and mitigating climate change is the main document. And the document identifies uh, strategic actions uh, uh, towards uh, creating resilience to climate change. And it also includes the national action plan uh, for, for climate change. There are 14 strategic actions, but none of them are directly related to fire management. Uh, and the national health strategy also mentions fires very briefly, very vague. It says include fire control in regeneration protection, whatever that means for me, it's very vague. Uh, so, but the potential is there, and this is uh, preliminary results from a gap fire model when we apply the, the DM0029 uh, for Niasa Reserve. This is a pre preliminary result, but basically the top table shows the baseline scenario in red and then the project scenario in green. And the results from the gap fire model indicates that the first, the second column, I would say it's the business as usual uh, emissions. Uh, and uh, the last column is the reduction in emissions from shifting the business as usual to a project scenario. Basically the project scenario, it's reverting the situation of having more uh, uh, late dry season fires to having uh, more early dry season fires and reducing the late dry season fires. And the results uh, show that we can uh, get a 60% reduction in uh, emissions uh, from uh, fire uh, management. So in summary, uh, uh, we, I, I should say that forest policies and governance uh, need to be revised and uh, clearly uh, fire management has to be uh, uh, given the, the right emphasis uh, it needs. The Red Plus system uh, in Mozambique needs to take into consideration that uh, the market is not only carbon, but there are other non-carbon benefits. And fire, are very, uh, is, it's very important for those non-carbon benefits. So needs to consider IFM as well. Uh, we need to get on the ground and from policies and governance, we need to actually have uh, experiences as Brazil has uh, in place. So uh, I would say that for now, we don't have any experience, but the NIASA Special Reserve is busy giving the first steps towards IFM program. And of course, research needs to be uh, a continued uh, action, needs to be better coordinated and also aligned with decision-making and IFM uh, initiatives. Uh, before I finish, I would like to briefly mention the Miombo Network of Southern Africa, which is the oldest of civil uh, network. Uh, it is, uh, well, it covers more than 100 people uh, across the, the world, not just the region, but uh, uh, other places of the world as well uh, are uh, in the Miombo Network. So here it's, you can see the webpage for updated uh, information. 
Our portfolio of action, it's very diverse. We promote collaborative research action. We have several projects going on right now. We also link with other systems and networks in, in Southern Africa, such as the SAFNET or Southern Africa Fire Network, in which, which is the fire network for the region. And we collaborate with SAFNET in several ways. We also work on disseminating information, not just on, 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 in terms of scientific publications, but also policy briefs. And I should mention our recent publication on uh, the Miyombo book uh, uh, that was a couple of months ago. Uh, and I think I'm done. I would like to acknowledge all my partners, funding sources, and also people working with me uh, over the years. And with this, I would like to thank you, and I'm very open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, this was spectacular, actually spectacular, the results that uh, appear from the modeling process of, of moving fire from uh, late dry season into the early dry season. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. First, it's a bit more eco ecological. Someone asked me at the very beginning of this um, webinar, how do I define uh, dry ecosystems? And the, the question is absolutely valid. And my question to you is, would you define Miombo as a dry ecosystem? Yes, I saw that question and um, I also agree with your question that I find uh, Miombo as a dry forest ecosystem, although when you get to the western side of Miombo, Angola, and southern uh, DRC, you get the more wet Miombo, but the seasonality is there and the precipitation ranges of uh, you know, for the dry forest ecosystems are there, so they don't get more than 1500 uh, uh, millimeters a year. So I would say yes, it's a dry forest ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I also answer that question the same way, that it is a recurrent, even though the question probably needs more thinking, but the, mm -hmm. um, it, for, for, for this webinar, the way that we are defining dry ecosystems is a recurrent a drought period uh, through seasonalities. Um, so that is for us the way to, <clears throat> sorry, in, in this chat to discuss that. Um, also regarding the governance setting, and I think that's uh, very interesting compared to Brazil, because probably Brazil also has uh, fire, no fire policies in the sense that pers using prescribed burning uh, might not be uh, easy to apply, but somehow there was a, a way to solve this issue. So there is one, one question then to Lara in terms of governance. Um, is, would you be able to share some lessons learned on how the situation of Mozambique right now where applying fire into the landscape is still not very policy clear? Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, please go. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, basically we are in the very, very early stages. As I mentioned, the, our policies are very prohibitive. Uh, well, the forest law, it's under revision, and I'm hoping that the fire issue comes up very, you know, properly in this uh, revision of the forest law. In terms of forest governance, they're still not very clear where fires are. Uh, they used to be at, at, uh, at uh, where in the National Disaster Management Institute. So they are taken as a, as a disaster, as a natural disaster. But at the point they just, uh, they haven't, you know, uh, addressed the issue of fire. So the forestry, uh, the, the National Directorate of Forests will be, I would say the, the institution in charge of fires, but for now, there's no clear, you know, mandate where fire should be. I would say mandate and actions actually on the ground. Very interesting. Uh, there is a question from Kate Parr. Um, it, see, she's mentioning that it is great that you are considering non-carbon objectives too, but uh, she was wondering whether the focus of reducing fires in some areas of, Nyas of Nyasa and that is probably the situation, I'm not sure you said reducing fires, might mean that you end up with greater homogeneity in vegetation structure and composition. Our work shows for that, uh, uh, that biodiversity conservation, greater pyrodiversity is needed in wetter savannas like the Miombo. My concern is that the fire abatement activities might work against this objective. Can you comment? Yes, I would say I, uh, I'm not 
I don't think reducing fires is it's the, the option. I would say that fire management is needed now to maintain the, na the natural fire regime or fire frequency in this case of every two to three years, okay? And I also would also think that, but you know, since we don't have experiences on the ground with concrete results, results I, would, I would say trying to uh, work on the early dry season fires to reduce the fuel load and reduce the intensity in the late dry season fires. Uh, I would say reducing it's the, uh, an option for me. And Just I very last question. It will be uh, an issue if you reduce fires. Yeah, I, I guess you were meaning for those areas where the increased fire frequency has moved away from the original uh, mm -hmm. uh, interval period of, of three years. You were saying that that was must, the, the, the normal interval period mm -hmm. and now it's moving into one. So what you would like to move back into that. Yeah. Are you, I mean, we saw a very clear aridity trend in Mozambique. We see a very clear climate pressure on um, on the eastern uh, yeah on on the eastern part of the South African uh, of the African continent, have you seen an effect of climate interacting uh, with fire? Are you measuring climate in your stations in Niasa? Yeah, no, we haven't we haven't yet uh, worked on, on on climate, but uh, actually on the four mine model uh, we want to you know activate the module. On, on climate change uh, to, to be able to get that picture of this one, but not yet. No. But, but I should say that my plots, my plots are across a, a, a fire frequency uh, a gradient, and the fire frequency is related to the RDT index. So we might be able to get some information from that. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thanks a lot. Let me open the floor for the last but not least the speaker. We have with us, uh, Roland, I'm sure I'm not going to pronounce that well, Fernoy from the uh, Free University of Amsterdam. Apologies for your pronunciation of your surname. Roland has a master on uh, sustainable energy science from the UPEC University, and he has run research on carbon sequestration and storage. His current research quantifies greenhouse gas emissions and aerosol from fires in woodland savannas in Africa and southern uh, in, in Brazil and Southern Africa to estimate emission factors and their variability. The goal is to better capture emission factors in regional and global emission models. Let me very quickly um, put your, your, your presentation into context. Um, we were trying also to see some example of fire, integrated fire management in the uh, Botswana Okabango uh, River Delta. But it happened that this wetland area it has a very um, strict fire regulation. It's not, not easy to work on, on fire management on that area. And then because of the complications of being um, a, a wetland also, um, this, this is right now, uh, integrated fire management in the Delta is right now not happening. But those of you who have interest, there is a document on, from the early 90s that was working on integrated fire management in the Okabango Delta for your interest. And um, Roland will be focusing on one of those variables from the uh, equation of emissions that is fundamental also to uh, promote emission reductions from dry late season into early dry season. Roland, the floor is yours, welcome. Well, thank you, Rosa, for the nice uh, elaborate introduction. Um, well, uh, like I said, uh, my name is Roland van Nooy. I'm a PhD student at the Vrije Universiteit uh, uh, in Amsterdam. And uh, today I'll present some of my uh, research to you on the spatial variable, uh, the spatial temporal variability of biomass burning emission factors, uh, and then specifically focusing on the savanna biome. Uh, Rosa also asked me to uh, share some of the, uh, the work that we've been doing in, the, um, in Northwestern Botswana, um, which unfortunately is not uh, focusing on the uh, Okavanga Delta. Um, so at the bottom of the screen here, you see a map that, um, that is already showed a couple of times. Um, well, this shows the carbon emissions from uh, global biomass burning as uh, calculated through GFAT4S. And the way these emissions are calculated uh, is presented here at the top of the screen. 
um, which uh, Rosa also already uh, showed. And I will focus on this last faction, the emission, fa uh, the emission factor, which is often defined as the grams of gas emitted for each uh, kilogram of dry biomass burned. Um, now, in general, we know that if uh, we burn earlier in the season, that uh, this tends to burn less fuel. Um, but we also know that burning earlier in the season, uh, if, if, uh, if we burn too early in the season, if the vegetation is still green or maybe even moist, that these fires tend to emit more uh, carbon monoxide, methane and nitrous oxide as opposed to carbon dioxide. Um, which are more harmful for the climate um, compared, to the, uh, uh, compared to full efficient combustion. Um, so if this is the case, then uh, this may uh, reduce some of the emission gains that we, uh, that we want from burning less fuel. So for this reason, uh, I would like to state it's important to always have combined measurements of uh, the amount of fuel that's being consumed as well as the emission factors. Uh, because models uh, like uh, the current way that we measure emissions um, don't take into account this seasonality um, and use biome static emission factors, basically. Um, now, the novelty of uh, uh, one of the novelties of, of the way we've been doing this is we use drones. Uh, this has the advantage of uh, allowing us to follow the fire front, front around. So we can take a lot more uh, measurements from a single fire. Uh, we can also target specific areas within the plume that we want to know more about. Um, so basically what you see here is uh, uh, this setup is uh, consists of a drone that's fitted with a sampling system, which fills up four bags in one flight. So each bag fills for 35 seconds. Um, after those uh, bags are filled, then we return back to the ground and we reload it with bags. So this way we typically get about 60 to 80 samples from a single fire. Um, at the, uh, currently we, um, uh, we've been measuring uh, uh, CO2, carbon monoxide, methane and nitrous oxide. So uh, the same evening after we take the measurements, we analyze, uh, we analyze the bags using um, cavity ring down spectroscopy. Uh, from now on, we can also measure PM 2.5 and black carbon. Unfortunately, all of the current uh, fieldwork uh, activities for 2020 were canceled, so we don't have any data to present on that yet. Um, besides emissions, we also measure uh, the fuel. So we uh, collect and weigh uh, different classes of fuel. Uh, so here you see a, a transact. So before the area burns, we tend to collect uh, the, the grasses, the litter, the coarse woody debris, and um, we uh, we log the, the state of the trees and uh, we calc uh, we uh, uh, and how many trees are there, and then we do that again after the fire to see how much uh, what the severity of the fire was and how much of the fine fuel was burned, uh, etc. And we also take uh, carbon uh, carbon content and nitrogen content and isotopic values. So just uh, for the people that, uh, that are not familiar with emission factors, just uh, to give a short introduction on how these factors are actually calculated. Um, so to get the, uh, the, the emissions, we uh, use a background concentration, which is determined before the fire. And we uh, uh, subtract this from the concentration in the samples. And the emission factors are then based on the, uh, the, fuel con uh, the carbon content of the fuel, which is a weighted average of the, uh, the total carbon that is combusted. So the different fuel classes that we use. And then there's a, uh, a factor to compensate for the molecular mass of the species that you're, uh, uh, that you're measuring at that point. And then because we know that we, uh, for carbon that we, uh, uh, that we actually capture a significant amount of the carbon that is being emitted. So we capture about 95 to 99%. Uh, then we also can see how much of this carbon was emitted as a certain species. Um, now we also know that we don't capture all the carbon. So for uh, some fractions of the carbon like the PM 2.5 up till now, 
uh, and the non-methane hydrocarbons, we base this, uh, so we estimate these values based on uh, literature, uh, uh, on previous literature. So since these drone measurements are a novelty, um, we, um, we compared them to uh, measurements that, uh, that are, have currently been done before, like mass measurements, uh, which basically have a continuous measurement uh, at, uh, at a one fixed point in the fire. So here on the right side of the screen, you see the measurement mass. This is a, a fire uh, in the Kruger National Park, by the way. Um, and this is what that looks like. So on the left side, you see a, fire, uh, a time profile, basically. And uh, then you see that when the fire front passes, you see uh, in a sharp peak of uh, predominantly C uh, carbon dioxide and black carbon, for instance. And uh, as, as the further we, uh, the, fire, the fire front uh, passes, uh, the more we get into the residual smoldering combustion, which is uh, dominated by carbon monoxide and, uh, and methane, uh, as well as PM2.5. So, um, uh, comparing the measurements that we did using the, our methodology using the drone, uh, comparing that to the mast. Uh, so here on the right side of the screen, you can see uh, fire averaged emission factors uh, for the two methodologies and you see that they agree quite well. Um, so over the past three years, uh, I've been looking at various uh, vegetation types within the savanna biome. Uh, and uh, the goal of this is really to capture the variability that there is in terms of emission factors. So we've been looking at uh, relatively dry savannas like the Kruger National Park uh, and uh, Northwestern Botswana, and also looked at uh, relatively uh, high, uh, uh, high rainfall areas like uh, the Jalapão area, which was previously discussed by Jonas, uh, as well as the, uh, the Nyasa National Reserve, which Natasha just talked about. Uh, besides the, the uh, spatial variability, we're also, of course, interested in the temporal variability, since this is very relevant for, uh, for integrated fire management. So we tend to revisit these places uh, in the early dry season, so roughly May, uh, June, uh, for these, these southern hemisphere places, and um, as well as the late dry season, uh, so our measurements in roughly uh, uh, September, October. So this is still very much a work in progress. So, um, uh, but this is pretty much uh, what that looks like. So we have, uh, we found a lot of uh, uh, variability uh, within the emission factors in uh, um, for different savanna ecosystems. So here on the top, you see the carbon monoxide. Um, on the second graph is the, represents the uh, methane emission factors. And then the bottom graph represents the uh, nitrous oxide emission factors. And you see that carbon monoxide and methane are very well correlated. Um, and for nitrous oxide, we, uh, we, we know a, a, a lot less. Uh, so there's not a lot of uh, measurements about that so far. Um, on the right side, you see the orange bar that represents the, uh, the biome for the study averaged emission factors as uh, represented in uh, Savannah literature. Also, some of them, if, if they mention it, then we also uh, separated them out for fire averaged emission factors. Um, and the more, what I want to say with this, this graph is basically with the emission factor variability is substantial within the savanna biome. Um, uh, however, much of this emission, this variability typically occurs in small landscape features that, um, that don't necessarily represent a lot of the burnt areas. For instance, the humid grasslands and the gallery forest in, uh, in the Jalapão. Uh, as well as uh, dumbos in the early dry season when they're still relatively green. Um, but this may indicate that there's a need for a different approach, a targeted approach for different vegetation types. Um, now, uh, Rosa asked me to also uh, tell you something, uh, give some introduction on the uh, project that we've been doing in the Northwest of Botswana. 
uh, led by uh, the group of uh, Jeremy Russell Smith. Um, here, the, the picture you see, uh, you see a very diverse group of, uh, of people. Uh, so some the researchers from Australia and, and the Netherlands, as well as some of the uh, uh, indigenous landowners that uh, were also starring in Jeff's presentation, as well as the people, um, the sun, uh, the Yungkwasi sun uh, that, uh, that live in the Northwest of, uh, of Botswana. Um, so this is uh, roughly the area um, that, uh, that, uh, that we've been looking at. Uh, again, I'd like to stress that this is not the, though it's close, it's not the Okavanga Delta and it's not similar in terms of vegetation type, uh, fire management or, uh, or land use. Uh, in fact, this is a, a woodland savanna with a mean average rainfall of about, uh, about 600 millimeters a year, a mean annual rainfall. Here on the left side, you see the fire frequency in the years 2001 to 2019 uh, as derived from the modus, uh, modus burnt area. And on the right side, you see the uh, fire emissions over the years 2003 to 2019 as, a, uh, as calculated through GFET4S. Um, so looking at this, this, it becomes clear why we chose this area. Um, it's, a, it's an area that, although it's, it's relatively, uh, relatively dry, so it's really at the bottom of the, of the scale for the, uh, the Australian fire management uh, approach, um, it's still an area that burns a lot, and uh, although much lower than the, uh, than the, the more humid uh, areas to the north, it still has a very significant emissions. So this is what it looks like uh, on the ground. So this is near the Sodillo Hills enclave. Um, and on the left side, uh, you see a fire which is uh, lit by, uh, so it's a, it's a prescribed fire lit in June by uh, the fire managers. Um, on the right side, you see a non-prescribed burn that we've been measuring uh, in um, uh, uh, September. Um, so what becomes clear is that the impact on the vegetation uh, is, is much more severe on, uh, uh, in the case of the, the late dry season fire, and this was confirmed by our field plots, uh, of course. Um, so here this graph shows on the left three uh, box plots, it shows the emission factors that we measured from uh, dry savanna in, um, in, in Botswana. Um, to put that into perspective, we also show some uh, emission factor plots uh, that we've done the same year in uh, more humid savanna in uh, the Niasa National Reserve uh, in collaboration with uh, Natasha Ribeiro. And um, what you see here is that uh, the seasonal difference in uh, dry savanna between uh, uh, the early dry season and late dry season, although they, the fires in the late dry season were significantly more severe, is that uh, the emission factors didn't change that much. Um, however, you see, for instance, in other vegetation types like uh, woodland savanna, um, that these, these uh, differences can be very different. Uh, so there you see an increase in, in uh, methane uh, emission factors in the late dry season. And uh, you see that for instance, uh, smaller uh, landscapes, uh, features like, like uh, Dumbo grasslands, which typically uh, uh, were more uh, determined by geomorphology and, uh, and, um, and soil type as well. Um, that this, this pattern is, is uh, very different over the season. So uh, our implications for integrated fire management in Botswana, uh, so our results indicate that, uh, that technically it's, it's possible, so it's feasible. Uh, at least uh, the, um, uh, the emission factors are not uh, significantly different in the early and late dry season. Um, the, also, we found that, that in the late dry season, the, the fuel loads tended to be higher, mostly through an, uh, an input of uh, deciduous litter. Um, and we found that uh, in the late dry season, the, the, uh, the fires were significantly more intense. 
so thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Roland, that was super interesting. Um, and, and just to put this back into context, um, uh, emission factors have a role on defining emissions uh, per year by multiplying the area burn, the fuel that it's burned, and then the amount of, 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 of that fuel that goes into different uh, categories of gases. I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Um, First, how different are the values that you are getting from those that are in the refinement of the 2019 guidelines? Are you finding uh, very low site specific responses for emission factors in the sense that if, if these emission factors are very site specific, it's going to be very hard to give something that is really scalable. So uh, yeah. how, how would you improve the IPCC the refinement value? So that, that is something, uh, definitely, uh, it's not possible to get these, these type of uh, field measurements for, uh, uh, for, uh, on a global scale. So that's something that we're working on now as well, uh, is uh, basically looking at how we can scale these factors uh, using satellite data. If we can, uh, if we can uh, understand this, this variability and maybe even predict some of this va uh, variability. Uh, so that would be a, a, good, a good start. Uh, uh, agreed, agreed. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Perfect. No, I, I would say probably as, as Georg was saying for Australia, it was very important for them to get their own emission factors for their own vegetation uh, in, in Australia so that they had more target heat also uh, reduce uncertainties in their own emissions, right? So that would be a good reason why some countries that want to enter the carbon market, they might want to do some of the drone uh, analysis that you are also doing for their ecosystem. So what? It's, it's definitely important to get more data and more, yeah, more variability. Perfect. Uh, let me let me see what the um, attendees are saying. Panelists, do you have a question for Roland? If not, I have one extra for you, Roland, and uh, we will yeah, open sure. just the final session. Um, I have a question regarding the combination of fuel of fuel types and vegetation types. So when you are burning, uh, you need to assign that emission factor to certain. By, well, how would I say that so to certain ecosystem type? But you could have different vegetation types within the same definition, right? So how are you capturing? the variability of the vegetation in your emission factors because i can see that could be hard to you mean like that. different types of fuels within within uh within a fire or? imagine miombo you could have like a gradient of uh woody uh forested uh canopy covers within the the miombo ecosystem so how would you be able to separate savannas that have different percentages of canopy cover, for instance? How, how do you... Yeah. So this is, this is definitely something that is uh, very difficult. Uh, like at the moment, these, these, um, uh, these separations are quite uh, strict. But um, what we're trying to do now, for instance, is to, um, to couple the, the emission factors that we measured at a certain uh, uh, location uh, couple that to uh, more uh, uh, remotely sensed data so for instance then we uh, we can uh, combine the the, um, the fractional tree cover that we have from uh, modis or even landsat scale and combine that to uh, emission factors from a certain pixel and that would be the way to scale this up i think or to capture this uh, this variability uh -huh, with a combination of, of extra satellite data. Uh, Louver Schott has a question for you, Roland. He says, he asks, uh, so what are the primary sources of variation at the moment? What have you found? Is vegetation type more important than fuel moisture content? Um, it's a combination of the two, I'd say. So in some, some vegetation types, we see that, uh, that within the span of our, our measurements, uh, we don't see that much of a seasonal difference. Uh, in, in other uh, 
vegetation types, the seasonal difference is huge, but this, this may also be related to just the time span that we measure. So for instance, in dry savannas, which are already fully cured when we start, started the, the, the measurements. So in June, uh, when we started the, the integrated fire management, uh, then you don't see this, this huge seasonality, whereas some, some for instance, um, uh, Dumbos may be still green at this point. And that's why we, uh, yeah, yeah, that's why it's important, I think, to, to look at, uh, to specialize, to use a targeted approach for these kind of small landscape features. Uh, because, for, of course, there might be other considerations uh, that you still want to burn these these vegetation types under under these uh, circumstances. Mm -hmm. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is that is perfect. Okay, Roland, that was fantastic, super interesting. Thank you so much. Also, you have given us, yes. together with Jonas, some methodological uh, tools to to work on understanding mapping fuel loads and and mapping emission factors. Um, we are going to now um, close the webinar by i'm going to ask the panelists uh actually to share with uh, the attendees um whatever lessons learned you would like to share with with them on your experiences with integrated fire management and um how it can reduce emissions and how that could be considered as part of uh, mitigation targets that goes into different carbon markets so uh, those of you who would like to participate, um, just jump in. Um, I would like to start by mentioning uh, three of them. Um, one is what I'd like to make a, a recall that this webinar has focused on dry ecosystems and it has focused on prevention activities within inter integrated fire management and particularly uh, prescribed burning. But as Anya said, one needs to look at, at the whole portfolio of options. Uh, prescribed burning might work for some places, it might not work for others. So we don't want to sell this webinar as is prescribed burning is the solution for uh, reducing fire emissions. Any activity that reduces areas burned, the fuel loads, and the um, uh, emission factors that would apply as, as valid and it doesn't have to be prescribed burn. Also, uh, another warning that uh, when we think of scalability, we're talking about dry ecosystems, and we already have discussed that dry ecosystems here is, is vaguely defined, but basically we're talking about areas that have uh, drought stress, recurrent drought stress during annual seasonalities. Um, but this type of uh, activity would never be implemented into a wet, non-fire adapted um, ecosystem. So also be aware that uh, this is uh, not the lesson that you are taking from this webinar, that this can be extrapolated to any ecosystem uh, or that this has to be the right uh, tool. Uh, there is an interesting debate to be held on wetlands. And I think because of the situation of the Pantanal and also because of the situation of the Paraná Delta, uh, which is a frequently burned area, but this year got completely out of control. Um, and also for c expertise, also an interest in Indonesia, the topic of how to reduce emissions in wetland areas uh, would probably require further attention. Because as Geoff said, you need to do the baseline. If there was fire before and you can find a way to reduce the fire in relationship to the baseline, that would work. Uh, but because wetlands have soil component that also burns, it has to be uh, carefully decided which type of integrated fire management it has to be applied. And, and, and that would be my highlights for this webinar. If, for instance, uh, Lara, that has, if she's here because she had to leave actually, but if Lara was here, I think the expertise of, um, of um, El Cerrado would be fantastic. Um, I think she left. Yeah, she left. Okay. So I think from Lara's point of view, one thing that is also a very important lesson learned is the interagency collaboration. You cannot do that alone with just one agency. The same way that you, when we are working right now with blue carbon and regulated carbon markets at national scale, 
uh, even though you might want to sell forest carbons or savanna carbons, you still need to have a dialogue with the Ministry of Finance, uh, with the ministries of um, uh, infrastructure, with the mining industry. So you really want to have a very coordinated debate about uh, this process of multi-agency uh, collaboration. Um, and in the case of Australia, what really acted as a very strong enabling factor was the fact that there was already a carbon price associated to an already uh, ready to implement methodology. So scientists in this webinar, the, the best way to support the movement of this type of activities is to make sure that we have all the data ready to start applying that and, and kind of pitching the, uh, the government to move ahead with that. So Natasha, Jonas, Roland, if any of you would like to add some comments about the scalability, about issues to be concerned, please go ahead. I'm, I'm back into uh, the, the session, um, if I'm allowed to say something. Oh yes, of course, Anya, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I've just uh, saw the last uh, couple of minutes of um, Lara and then uh, could see Natasha and uh, Ronald. So, and actually, thank you very much for this very interesting webinar. And I'm um, and unfortunately couldn't follow Lara, but I would like to highlight again, and I've just kind of written it into the chat as well. Don't fall into the trap that IFM is only prescribed burning. I really would like to caution you and to look at all the other elements. And I've, I've, I've been uh, hearing Ronald talking quite a lot of saying, yeah, IFM, IFM, and, the, and then referring to controlled or prescribed burning. So it is, it is one element of integrated fire management. And we had very long discussions in Brazil to really um, break this cycle of thinking that now prescribed burning is the solution to many other challenges and problems on the ground. So just, um, yeah, wanna emphasize this again. So controlled or prescribed burning, whether it's on large scale with government agencies or whether it's controlled burning with communities is, is one solution for the, or can be one solution for a specific problem or challenge on the ground. Absolutely, Anya. Absolutely, thank you. Absolutely for reminding that. And let me let me have the uh, the opportunity also to ask you. Someone was asking about um, emission abatement for wetland areas. Do you have some experience there? Um, no, not emission abatement. I mean, wetland areas have, have been connected in the chat with uh, Diane. Uh, I think is her name. Um, yeah, um, Diane. Yeah. Um, we, we just finished a closed project on uh, West Kalimantan uh, on uh, this is maybe peatland in West Kalimantan, but we were not kind of highlighting or emphasizing their uh, prescribed burning for um, uh, prevention measures. It was more on the community based fire management side, introducing introducing alternative use of fire for income. But um, I've been in contact with Diana. Yeah. Perfect. Actually, during the chat, someone asked, um, what about promoting agricultural activities with zero fire? Um, and I mean, the question do have some interest in the sense that a lot of the fires or some of these fires that reach to the forest come from agricultural fires. but depending on, on the continents, many of them are just provoked to, to, to transform the land use and, and um, advance the, the expansion of other land uses. But uh, the role of agriculture and fire, we are not discussing it here, although I would fully agree it does have a component uh, also of, of, of connection with, with what we are discussing here, for sure. Uh, would you like to mention something on that, Anya, on the role of fire in agriculture? I think that is worth an own webinar. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. because it's, it is rather complex. Um, also, looking in, in different countries and, and, and different fire uses in agriculture. 
and looking at traditional, uh, the traditional indigenous fire use on shifting cultivation or now kind of changing uh, agriculture systems and the use of fire. So like all these fires in, uh, or a lot of fires in Indo Indochina, for example, Myanmar, India is, and the smoke haze pollution is burning off the agriculture waste. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the rice harvesting uh, waste, for example. So yeah, I would say we can open an, an, an own webinar on that. <laughs> to well, I agree. That. Yeah. Anya and, and Rosa, uh, here is Lara. I, I didn't leave yet the webinar. I uh, just would like to comment very quickly regarding these alternatives to fire uh, use in agriculture. That is uh, an interesting project that was carried out in Brazil and in Bolivia and now is in Ecuador. This project is uh, called Amazon Without Fire. And the focus of this uh, project is to uh, 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 have trainings and, and capacitation to small communities, how to manage the, the, the land without the use of fire. So for people who are interested in this, uh, in this topic, please uh, search in the Google Amazon Without Fire project. Thank you. Wonderful, Lara. Thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> let, me, let me open the space for Natasha. Natasha, would you like to share some experiences uh, on, on, on what would be the lessons learned that you might want to talk to other Biombo colleagues in, in the network about uh, restoring um, fire regimes? And, and one question I have for you is why do you think fire regimes are changing, in, 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 especially in a, in a protected area? Thank you, Rosa. Um, yeah, fire regimes are changing for several reasons. I think one of the main reasons is population growth. The, the rates of population growth across the region are very high, 2% uh, a year, more or less, uh, for the whole region. So, and because most of the people are rural and depend on the forest resources, shifting cultivation is one of the main activities. You know, fire being one of the main management tools, then the, the fire uh, frequencies are increasing. But there's also uh, your question about the climate change and how the, 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 the climate plays a role in changing the fire regimes. I think there's uh, also this issue, although it's not uh, studied in depth in the region, but for sure. Uh, Climate change. If if it's not if not if not today, it will play in the near future a role in changing fire regimes. So my my I would say my lessons from the 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 what my experiences in Mozambique and in the region. I would say that uh, we have to include you know uh, local people, traditional knowledge in these uh, IFM programs. Uh, as as we have discussed here, people are living in Myombo and in Serrada for many years now. The experience is there. If we don't integrate in this knowledge, I don't think we'll be successful in our uh, integrated fire management. And uh, as I said, also, uh, the, the case of Mozambique governance and policies need to be adjusted and fire needs to be uh, taken into consideration really in, in our policies and in our governments. I should mention that in the region, in the Miyambo region, Tanzania, I guess it's the only country with, uh, with experience in, and I would say successful experience in integrated fire management, but we need more than that. Just, you know, spreading okay. the, across the region. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, that reminds me of the fantastic initiative that Roland was showing us with the with the bringing of the Australian colleagues mm -hmm. into the Miombo region. That that was a fantastic uh, uh, initiative. How, how wonderful! Uh, Roland and Jonas, would you like to mention something? Yes, I mean, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm not in a position to talk about. Um, the IFM implementation in the different countries in Mozambique, Australia, Brazil, or elsewhere. But um, because I'm a data person, but um, my lesson learned was actually that um, there's an excellent data set which comes from space. So the Earth observation data can deliver data-driven arguments 
um, for IFM imp implementation, not only prescribed burning, as, uh, as Anja said, let's say the whole integral measurement of IFM effects um, can, can in parts be well uh, monitored using Earth observation data. And uh, well, I'm happy to, to support these local um, endeavors with these data-driven approaches. Um, so, well, I'm not in a position to talk about IFM implementation per se, but there's a lot of excellent data there which can support, no, and communicate uh, IFM totally. uh, activities. Totally, uh, Jonas. And I, and I actually think the field modeling that you developed for, for uh, in collaboration with other colleagues is a fantastic example of how this can be directly implemented for, for implementation and for, for policy development. So I think that that is... Mm -hmm. A fantastic example. That was that was totally excellent. So that was a kind of a straightforward approach, which which was totally uptaken by the Brazilian colleagues. Um, so they really implemented on it on an operational basis. Um, they are doing that since many years in the meantime, though. So this is a great success story where um, yeah, data is also used to plan to evaluate the effects of IFM. Excellent. Totally. Thank you so much, Jonas. Roland. You were the last, so maybe you already said a lot of things, but let me open in case you want to say something else. Um, yeah, sure. No, I thought it was uh, it was very nice to see like uh, uh, the the huge amount of, of positive, uh, yeah, effectiveness that there was uh, that was presented, and just the the amount of uh, mostly like the 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 the. the change that has occurred over the, the last uh, decennia in, in Australia and Brazil and uh, now also I think uh, in Africa. So I was, uh, yeah, inspired. <laughs> Agreed. I think, I think with those words, I'd like to finish this webinar because inspiring is the word that, uh, the case examples that we've seen, the, the implementation work in, in Cerrado was a spectacular. The, the positive results also that have been shown by, by Lara, and by, by Jonas of, of the effects on, on, on vegetation and burn areas and emissions are like, like taken out from a, from a, from a book. And um, Australia also is a good example of how things can really move when there are the right and enabled conditions and have been a win-win situation. So thanks very much to all the speakers. I know you were all busy. There are different timings. Geoff is, is an angel. He stayed with us until 1 a.m. in the morning. So our gratitude, even though he's sleeping now. And to all the rest of the panelists and the remaining attendees, thank you so much. We will be leaving the audio and the presentations. Sorry, I should have put my video. Sorry. Uh, we should have. We will be leaving the audio and the presentations in the link that I placed on the chat. And if you registered, you will receive this information. So. Thank you very much to everyone and we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you.